The hour of 6.30 having come and gone, I will call to order the Common Council meeting of Tuesday, March 21st, 2023, and ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you. Aldo Ahelier. Aldo Ahelier is present. Alder Benford. Present. Alder Benford is present. Alder Bennett. Yes. Alder Bennett is present. Alder Carter. Present. Alder Carter is present. Alder Conklin. Here. Alder Conklin is present. Alder Curry. Here. Alder Curry is present. Alder Evers. Here. Alder Evers is present. Alder Figueroa Cole. Here. Alder Figueroa Cole is present. Alder Foster. Here. Alder Foster is present. Alder Furman. Present. Alder Furman is present. Alder Harry McKinney. Get back to you. Alder Heck. Here. Alder Heck is present. Alder Madison. Alder Madison is present. Alder Miadze. Alder Miadze is present. Alder Paulson. Present. Alder Paulson is present. Alder Fair. Here. Alder Fair is present. Alder Tischler. Alder Tischler is present. Alder Revere. Here. Alder Revere is present. Alder Vitterer. Alder Vitterer is present. Madam Mayor, we have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, remind us once again that we're here to do the business of the people of the city of Madison and ask that we do so with kindness and assuming good intent. And in particular, that we refrain from using any profanities, whether we are on the council, on staff, or a member of the public here to co make comments. Alder Better. I did not hear my name. I didn't see it say here yet. Terribly sorry. I saw that you were in the, uh, in the room, so I didn't want to know you was present. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry about that. Thank you, Alder. All right. Our first item of business is honoring resolutions. We'll start with item one, Legistar 75219, commending and thanking Tom Solist for his dedicated service to Vera Court Neighborhood Center and to the residents of Madison. And to read the resolution, I will turn to Alder Miadze. Uh, that, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, first, before reading the resolution, hopefully uh, you don't mind me uh, talking about uh, Vera Court for a quick second. Um, <laughs> um, I'll make a motion that uh, say a few words before. Just make a motion to, uh, to approve. A motion to approve. Second. Moved and seconded to approve item one. Uh, Alder, if you'd like to speak to the motion and then read the resolution. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, well, as a single father raising three kids on the north side isn't a, such an easy task. But when you have community centers such as Vera Court, it makes it a lot easier. Um, you know, to have kids, as soon as they get out of school, be fed, also go on field trips, also, you know, academics is important as well, but when they have problems in schools as far as um, needing help, Vera Court was there to help them. So I'm really grateful for Vera Court and what our community centers uh, does. Tom Solis has been the director when all three of my kids went to Vera Court, so I am d deeply grateful. So here, I'll read the resolution. Whereas, Tom, oh, let's see, let's see, hold on a second. It's probably easier to read this paper. Whereas Tom started in 2000 as a ro staff role member at Vera Court Neighborhood Center and was devoted over 22 years to the organization. And whereas Tom served as a executive director of Vera Court Neighborhood Center Incorporated, which includes Vera Court Neighborhood Center, Bridgepoint, Lake Point, Winona Neighborhood Center, and Latino Academy of Workforce Development. And whereas Tom has since led the expansion of the organization to include doubling in size, including the addition of middle and high school wing, updating computer labs, and a kitchen that has doubled in size, and whereas Vera Court's Neighborhood Center programming under Tom's leadership has grown to include Girl Neighborhood Power, Life as a Boy, Young Leadership Program, Rise Middle School, High School Leadership Program, and Elementary After School Program that serves 50 kids after every day. And also whereas programs include free after school services, summer camps, services for families, and 15,000 meals a year. And whereas 90% of the population the center serves is low income. Now therefore, be it resolved that the mayor and common council commend and thank Tom Solis for his dedicated service to Vera Court Neighborhood Center 
and the residents of Madison. Thank you, Alder. It's been moved and seconded, and we have uh, with us to accept the resolution, Baltazar de Anda Santana. Baltazar? Yeah, either side. Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for your service. Uh, I'm humbled to, my name is Baltasar Diana Santana, Executive Director of the Latino Academy of Workforce Development. Uh, I am humbled to be given the opportunity to accept this resolution on behalf of Mr. Tom Solist. I am aware that the only reason I'm here is because he's right now in a secret location known only to few, enjoying retirement. <laughs> Thank you, Tom, for letting me represent you today. I just realized this is the first time I'm acting on behalf of a white man, and it feels good. <laughs> <laughs> if Tom were here right now, he will definitely not be talking about himself. He will stay away from calling attention to what he had done, everything he had done. When I first met Tom in 2008, I was coming to teach a Spanish computer class when he asked me if I had ever taught computers, and I said no, he said, you are hired. That was actually the first class that marked the beginning of the Latino Academy of Workforce Development. The second memory I had in regards to working with Tom was when I, when I was a part-time Latino resource coordinator. The center leadership was having a meeting while I was in the next office. I overheard Tom saying, let us ask Baltasar. Let us see what Baltasar thinks. This was the first time I was included in the conversation in this country. This was the first time I was given the opportunity to give my own opinion. Tom did not know back then that this was the first time that I was asked to provide my own input. This was the first time I was given a seat on the table. That meant a lot to me. And Tom did that to many people who are part of the community center. Tom was the first executive director I know who saw the need for services in Spanish in both the Vera Core Neighborhood Center and Bridge Lake Point Community Center. All you know that Tom was one of the founders of the Latino Academy of Workforce Development. The Latino Academy exists because of the students, funders, partners, and of course, because of Tam Solis. Tam Vision brought strong programming for our South Side and North Side. I shared these stories before because that is exemplifies exempl that show us what Tam is, someone with, who empowers people and someone who has a vision. Many times, we wait until people die to recognize all the work they have done. Tam, thank you for all you did in the city of Madison and beyond. Thank you for your vision to make a better Madison, a better Wisconsin, and a better world. Our community is still a better community because of you. I know you are loving your retirement, but please do not forget your Madison family and your plants who await for you. Thank you. Thank you, Baltazar, and thank you for accepting the resolution on Tom's behalf. It's been moved and seconded. Is there further discussion? Alder Carter. Thank you, and thank you, Baltazar. I've known Tom for many, many years and worked closely with Tom since 2015. One thing I can say about Tom, he believed in inclusion. He believed in giving the opportunity to residents that, like Baltazar, would experience their first time receiving that opportunity, the opportunity to sit at the table, the opportunity to give their opinion, and the opportunity to soar and thrive. I want to thank Tom for his de dedication. 22 years of dedication. And I hope that in his secret location, that when he decides to come out, that he will volunteer again. Thank you and thank you, Baltazar. Thank you, Alder. Right. 
It's been moved and seconded. Is there any objection to recording an enthusiastic unanimous vote of approval? Seeing no objection, we'll record that vote. And thank you again, Baltasar, for being here. And we will move on uh, to disclosures and recusals. Are there any disclosures or recusals on tonight's agenda? Alder Conklin. Thank you. Um, it's actually, I just want to be added to a couple. Is now the right time to do that or? Uh, we, you can just hang on until we get to the consent agenda. We're almost sure. there. No Alder. Thank you. Are there any disclosures or recusals? Alder Tischler? Yeah, I just have to disclose. I, I, I work at the UW-Madison campus. I just see one of the, uh, I have no connection whatsoever to the, uh, uh, to the, uh, for, for, for the, for uh, the, Board of Health, uh, seven seven five nine nine five three. So, just wanted to make that known. Thank you, Elder. Are there any further disclosures or recusals? Seeing none, we'll move on to the presentation of the consent agenda. President Furman. Thank you, Mayor. A consent agenda is moved with recommended action listed for each item on the agenda, including public hearings, except one. Items which have registrants wishing to speak. Two items which alders have separated out for discussion slash debate purposes. Agenda items with recommendations different from the agenda. Agenda item 101, legislative file 76500, substitute amending Madison general ordinances related to previous versions and process of determining and making recommended motions related to council agenda items. Uh, the, uh, Alder Keith Furman, recommended action is adopt second substitute. Agenda item 103, legislative file 76649, authorizing the city of Madison to develop a comprehensive response to the crisis in home health care in Madison. Alder Barbara Vetter, recommended action is to adopt the second substitute. Agenda item 119, legislative file 76475, uh, agreements related to the Truman Olson grocery project. Alder Tag. Evers recommended action is to adopt the substitute. Agenda item 126, legislative file 76331, amending portions of section 9.23 of the Madison General Ordinance related to regulations of mobile home parks. The recommended action is different from the um, uh, consent agenda document you guys, uh, everybody re received earlier. Um, and the new recommended action from Alder Bennett is to re-refer this to the land Landlord Tenant Issues Committee on 420 and the Council on 425. Agenda items excluded by one requests of alders or two due to speakers registered by 640 p.m. on March 21st. Agenda item four, legislative file 75678, alternate chickens, um, speakers registered. Agenda item five, legislative file 76309, zoning related to 1601-1617 Sherman Avenue, um, suburban, suburban Employment District to um, TRU2, um, Traditional Residential Urban 2, um, speakers registered. Agenda item 101, legislative file 76500, substitute amending Madison general ordinances related to previous versions and process of determining and making recommendation motions related to council agenda, Alder Wahili. Agenda item 103, legislative file 76649, authorizing the city of Madison to develop a comprehensive response to the crisis in home health care in Madison, speakers registered. Agenda item 104, legislative file 76660, amending MGO to allow additional consideration opportunities, Alder Wahili. Um, agenda item 108 is no longer excluded. Um, agenda item 110 is no longer excluded. Agenda item 113 is no longer excluded. Legislative file, uh, agenda item 114, legislative file 76343, supporting metros, Madison Metro section 5339B and 5339C low or no admission grant application to the Federal Transit Administration for facility solar projects, chargers, and electric 60-foot articulated buses, Alder uh, Tischler. Agenda item 127, legislative file 75713, approving a certified survey map 
for 1601-1617 Sherman Avenue, speakers registered. Agenda item 135, legislative file 76398, authorizing the negotiation and execution of a contract with HNTB for continued passenger rail study services, uh, Alder Tischler. And agenda item 138, legislative file 76645, a substitute supporting bargaining between the office and Professional Employee International Union, Local 39, and CUNA Mutual Group. Um, speakers registered. All right, are there other items that alders would like uh, separated from the consent agenda? Ooh. Alder Benford, you were first. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, agenda item number 12. Item 12. Or, excuse me, questions for staff. Thank you, Alder. Alder Harrington McKinney. I'm open. Um, for 15. Twenty-nine, thirty-one, forty-five, one hundred one, one hundred two, one hundred four. And I'd like to be added as a sponsor for number nine, seven, five, nine, five, three. Thank you, Alder. Alder Carter. Yes, I have a question on 126. Item 126. Thank you, Alder. Alder Wahilahi. I have a question for 108-76200 and 110-76214 and 7634. The items uh, all the titular excluded. Uh, I want it back to the exclusion list. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Uh, Alder Carter. The current recommended motion on item 126 is to re-refer to the landlord tenant uh, committee and then back to the council on 425. Do you still wish exclusion on that item? I do have a question because I believe that mobile home parks are under the auspices of the state government. Yes, Alder, that's why it's being re-referred. Okay, that's fine. Thank you, Alder. Uh, Alder Conklin, now's your chance. Thank you. <laughs> um, can I be added to item number 14, legislator number 76655? Item, uh, agenda item 114, legislator number 76343. And agenda item number 26, legislator 76331. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Paulson? I would also like to be added as a sponsor to number 14 uh, in support of the pollinators. All right, making sure the clerk's got it all. And Alder Miyadze. Yes, can I be added to item 142, please? All right. Thank you, Alder. I see no other hands. Are there any further exclusions from the consent agenda or requests to be added as a sponsor? Seeing none, let's go through that because that was a lot. Um, so agenda items with recommendations different from the printed agenda and not also excluded. 
119, the recommendation is to adopt the substitute. 126, the recommendation is to re-refer to 421 landlord tenant and 425 common council. The following items will be excluded. Items 4, 5, 12, 15, 29, 31, 45, 101, 102, 103, 104, 108, 110, 113, 114, 127, 135, and 138. Should I go again? <laughs> okay. The recommendation on item 119 is to adopt the substitute. The recommendation on item 126 is to re-refer to landlord tenant on 421 back to the common council on 425. The following items are excluded. 4, 5, 12, 15, 29, 31, 45, 101, 102, 103, 104, 108, 110, 113, 114, 127, 135, and 138. Good? Okay. Alder Wahili. Can I be added as a sponsor 138? The clerk will add you as a sponsor, Alder. Thank you. Anything further on the consent agenda? Seeing none, President Furman. Move adoption. Moved and seconded to adopt the consent agenda. Is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor of the consent agenda? Seeing no objection, that vote will be recorded. And we will move on to public comment. Our first item for public comment is agenda item four, an alternate amending sections of the supplemental regulations and the ordinances related to the keeping of chickens. Our first registrant is Julie Banghart of District 11 to be followed by Mark Banghart to be followed by Philosophy Walker. Do we have Julie? Does not appear that we have Julie in the room. Is Julie on the Zoom? Julie, you should be able to unmute. There. there. Yes, hi. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi, this is Julie Banghart. Thank you for allowing me to talk. We and my husband support having chickens. Um, um, we feel that the number of eight is a good number because when people have only four chickens, they only lay for four years. So it's very hard um, to keep the eggs going without having to get new chickens. And if you had eight, that would allow us to have a um, rotating flock and be able to have chickens. We also, we also feel that um, there was a concern brought up, and it said that they were concerned that chickens would attract mice and rats to the area. And that, I want to tell you, is not true because chicken owners feed their chickens inside an enclosed run and in a feeder that is enclosed. If the chickens are outside in the backyard, they're eating grass and bugs. <laughs> so we don't let food out everywhere so that other animals can come. So uh, we just really hope that you are encouraged and allow the chickens to become to eight instead of just four. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Mark Banghart, also of District 11, to be followed by Philosophy Walker, to be followed by Mackenzie Zeiss. Julie, is Mark on the same Zoom as you? Oh, nope, there's Mark. Go ahead. 
Yes, good evening, thanks. I only have a few things to add to what uh, my wife has already said. And um, while there is an issue with the birds aging out and the need to bring in young birds to lay, another aspect of it is that birds are um, a very social animal. And the uh, four chickens can sometimes make it difficult to get to the size that they're comfortable in. They're used to being in a flock and eight would make it much more comfortable and happy for the chickens. Um, the other issue I wanted to address is on the issue of noise, which we've heard some people talk about at the planning commission. And um, I just wanna make sure the council understands that uh, chickens, as soon as it gets dark, they are dead quiet. Uh, they go up on the roost and they make no noise. And during the day, hens make very little noise. Um, in our neighborhood, we, Obviously we have our chickens, but we have a lot of other dogs and we are friends with all of our neighbors and they share with us how much louder the dogs are than the chickens. So um, I, I can't foresee there being an issue with noise with the chickens relative to other domestic animals. Um, those are the points I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you. Our next and last registrant is Philosophy Walker of District 10. I don't know why it started and I can't get it to stop. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi, my name is Philosophy Walker and I'm a resident of the Orchard Ridge neighborhood on the west side of Madison. And today I am here in support of agenda item number four to increase the number of chickens allowed on a property in the city of Madison. I've been keeping chickens since 2020 here and I've long believed that Madison should raise the number of chickens allowed to at least 10, but I will take eight if that's what you will give me for the following reasons. Um, first of all, chicken keeping is difficult for beginners with a four chicken maximum because nearly every place from which chickens can be ordered, such as hatcheries or farm supply stores, require a minimum purchase of five chicks. Each spring, this minimum results in some people needing to find homes for the fifth chick or even just blatantly breaking the law when they can't find someone to take the extra baby. Secondly, chickens lay eggs for about three to four years, but they live for an average of seven years. As a result, most backyard flock keepers start with four chickens to maximize egg production, but then end up in a situation where their chickens no longer lay and they have no way to get more laying hens unless they give up or kill the chickens they currently own. This is difficult and painful for people for whom chickens are pets, not just livestock. Now, why should you care about those two points? Um, that's what I'm going to tell you now. Chicken keeping is an economical and an easy way to su supplement a family's food budget, and it doesn't just help individual families. The more chickens a family keeps, the more extra eggs they have, and the more extras get sold or given away to nearby neighbors. I personally give several dozen eggs to food pantries every summer, and most of my neighbors all get a few extra dozen for free throughout the year, and that helps everyone's food budgets, not just mine, in the neighborhood. Um, the average price of a dozen eggs in the United States is $4.80 right now, and increasing local egg production decreases demand for corporate egg supplies, which can ease prices. Lastly, I did just want to touch on something. I did just want to concur with what Julie said. Chickens not only do not attract rodents, but anybody who's kept chickens knows that chickens are omnivorous and will, in fact, eat rats and mice. So uh, that should not be a problem. I urge you to support this change. Thank you. Thank you. That uh, is all the registrants wishing to speak on item four. Are there questions for any of our registrants? Seeing none, we'll go on to item five, uh, which is creating sections of the Madison General Ordinances to change the zoning of 1601 to 1617 Sherman Avenue. Our first registrant is Cheryl Elkington of District 12, to be followed by Darren Jolas, to be followed by Doug Hirsch. Do we have Cheryl? Hello? Yes, go ahead. Hi, I have to oppose the project that is supposedly going in on the property. There are uh, property ownership issues. There are issues of safety for the project because of the fragile area and it being spring and there may be rains. And I, I also have to insist that it be deferred. And as a joint authority, I am requesting a um, vote from the floor that um, it be deferred back to the Landmarks Commission. 
Thank you. Our next registrant is Darren Jolis of Chicago to be followed by Doug Hirsch to be followed by Barbara Smith. Let's see if I can get this. Hello. Um, thanks, Heather. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, good to see everyone again. I'm Darren Jolis with Vermilion Development. Uh, next slide, please, Heather. This is an aerial photo that identifies the location of the proposed residential project at 1617 Sherman Avenue. Next slide, please. And we're returning to council after being here in early February. This slide shows the timeline of the important dates for the project. The uh, yellow color indicates various neighborhood meetings that we've had, which are four in total. And the official public meetings are indicated in blue. And to date, we've had two landmarks meetings, two UDC meetings, one plan commission meeting, and this is our second common council meeting in which we hope for approval of the rezoning in the CSM this evening. Next slide, please. We've worked with staff and neighborhood residents to incorporate the positive changes that are represented here tonight. And while the comprehensive plan and this urban infill location support significant density in the form of medium density residential or roughly 675 units. We heard the feedback from the neighborhood and designed a project with 331 residences or 49% of what's allowed. We reduced the total parking count by over 220 cars and enclosed 90% of those parking stalls indoors, which had the added benefit of creating five times the open space that's required. Next slide, please. Um, staff and the UDC have also had a significant impact on our plan. This includes a new city of Madison Street that allows for long range planning and connectivity to this part of the isthmus. This new street and Sherman Avenue have been activated by a total of 32 residences that each have direct pedestrian walk up access. So essentially a front door on the street as indicated in the purple on this drawing. The yellow and blue sidewalks show the future pedestrian circulation along the new street that would be created and throughout the balance of the site. Next slide, please, Heather. This perspective, which is roughly from 500 feet or so in the air, uh, shows how well the project fits in with similar dense residential communities along the north side or the north bank of the Yahara River. You can see it fitting in there. It also shows the vegetative buffer that was created in collaboration with the Madison Parks Department, which is meant to maintain the sight lines from the Yahara River as well as Tenney Park. Next slide, please, Heather. You're all familiar with the increase in housing demand and the corresponding lack of supply that currently challenges growth in Madison. 70,000 people moving here in the next decade, um, roughly 10,000 new homes in five years are needed. And by locating housing here, this project aligns with the Imagine Madison plan, as well as the Emerson East Eakin Park Yahara neighborhood plan, the That's comprehensive time. plan. Thank you. You're welcome. Our next registrant is Doug Hirsch from District 19 to be followed by Barbara Smith, to be followed by Kira Light. Doug? Thank you, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Doug Hirsch, I'm with Potter Lawson, architect on the project, and I wanna give you just a brief overview of the exterior design of the project in less than three minutes, hopefully. Next slide, please. Um, this is a view of the building from Sherman Avenue. Uh, previously, we had a six-story building with uh, sloped roofs, this is now showing a four-story building that steps back to a five-story building with a one-story portion um, in the center there creating a green roof courtyard. Next slide. This is just a detail of one of the outdoor terraces, all of the units along Sherman Avenue and up to 32 units on the site actually are walk-up units connected to the street. Next slide, please. This just shows the, one of the two green roofs that we have, which enclose parkings. The parking is structured, and this shows some of the activity on that green roof. Next slide, please. Um, just one of the entrances to the building on the new public street that bisects the site. Next slide. Um, on the north side of the new public street, adjacent to the three-story Sherman Terrace um, condominiums, um, we are showing two-story townhomes these are all two-story, uh, a two-bedroom, three-bedroom sort of family units. They have garages in the back. Um, next slide. 
This shows some of the garages that are in the back there and the scale of the buildings up against the Sherman Avenue condos. Next slide, please. Um, this is a building C then also on the public street, which also has um, entrances on the public street as well as walk-up units along the street. And then this is just a list of some of the sustainable features. Uh, the project will go after green built certification. Um, we're also working with uh, a focus on energy to come up with additional um, strategies. And the next slide shows the back of Building C that uh, sort of faces Tenney Park. It's over 100 feet away from the property line, but in the foreground is a um, stormwater detention area that will be planted with indigenous species. So, And then uh, you can see the community gardens along the building as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, next registrant is Barbara Smith of District 6 to be followed by Kira Light to be followed by Robert Johnson. We have Barbara. Don't see Barbara in the room. Barbara, you should be able to unmute. I did. Go ahead. Okay. I'm opposing this development because we need more time to figure out the way forward on this. We're losing most of our bus service on this stretch of Sherman Avenue even though this development adds 330 new households. So it doesn't make sense. Most of the time, residents will not be able to see the bus and will have to walk through private parking lots to get to Fordham Avenue to reach the bus. So we're adding a lot of parking here, but drastically cutting the bus service. Um, also, this is not on the bus rapid transit, but it is in the transit-oriented development and so the TOD zoning rules say there's no parking minimums, but this design has more than one parking spot per housing unit. Also, um, the paved road is wider than what would be best for a walkable human scale neighborhood because parking spots were added to both sides of the road. And in another way, we're also encouraging investment in fossil fuel infrastructure because um, it appears that you know, beneficial electrification such as heat pump space and water heat um, haven't been included or I'm not sure if they were considered instead of it's just standard natural gas. Um, I'm also concerned about too many large trees on the south and west side of the lot being lost. Um, we're gonna live with this development indefinitely so we need more time to make sure the design is right. Um, I am a long-term renter. Um, with all the changes happening with the bus rapid transit, bus route redesign, and the TOD, it's hard for people here to figure out how this fits in. Um, we're getting dense development, but it's not in the place where the bus service is increasing. In this case, it's where the bus service is being cut. Thank you. Thank you. Our next registrant is Kira Light of District 13 to be followed by Robert Johnson to be followed by Larry Nesper. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, my name is Kira Light and I'm a resident of Chapman Street. I fully support expansion of housing in Madison. I work as part of a large corporation in Madison that is continuously growing and I've seen firsthand how housing accessibility can have a monumental impact on our employee experience. In my role, I'm responsible for creating experiences that attract and retain worldwide top talent. It is my team's responsibility to do this through uh, perks and benefits, but, not, but also what our communities have to offer um, for talent considering relocation to the Madison area. In the past few years, especially, I have heard from candidates, current employees, and young professional friends that housing, specifically rental housing, is difficult to obtain. I've had multiple friends wait over a year to find a property in Madison, and candidates have backed out of offers due to low availability of rental properties. This does not support growth in our community, and in fact hinders it because our employees are choosing housing outside of Madison and roles outside of our community. From an employee experience standpoint, this is detrimental because it increases commute times and um, 
also has a negative impact on overall work experience and collaboration in the office. As a young professional myself, supporting this project means supporting my community by, by increasing opportunities to connect with others in my age demographic and encouraging growth of population, which leads to new experiences and events for everyone. This benefits not only businesses in Madison, but people of Madison. I am in support of this project and highly recommend we approve this project and many more like it. Thank you. Our next registrant is Robert Johnson of District 12 to be followed by Larry Nesper to be followed by Lindsay Lee. Robert, you should be able to unmute. Robert, you should have a prompt to unmute yourself. It might be hidden under a window. Right, we're going to come back to you, Robert. Do we have Larry Nesper? Hello. Oh, uh, let's go ahead, Robert. Okay, thank you. I'm one of the group of eight non-existent homeowners who apparently have non-existent homes between 1636 and 1662 Sherman Avenue across the street from the proposed project. I make this observation because at page two of the Vermilion Group February 13, 2023 letter of intent to the Landmarks Commission, they identified the site of their proposal project as I quote, surrounded by existing multifamily developments to the Southeast, the Sherman Terrace condominiums to the North, the community of Maple Bluff to the Northwest, Beeline Park and Lake Mendota to the west and the Hero River and Tenney Park to the south, close quote. What they neglected to identify are the homes of residents between 1636 and 1662 Sherman Avenue who have never received an invitation to one of their so-called neighborhood meetings, but who have attempted to express their feelings and concerns about this project in any way they can, albeit the city thus far does not seem to be inclined to consider uh, their concerns uh, of particular interest. These are the people most affected by this project, not the people who drive by the site um, of the project, nor the members of the commission who have been reviewing the project and holding meetings to discuss and which comments by the public are limited to three minutes. Not the representatives of the project itself who do not live anywhere near the site, but the people who live directly across the street from the project and the Sherman Terrace condominiums to the north of the project. I find it interesting that the vast majority of individuals who have spoken for, uh, favor this project during the public comments in the past about the project and not live anywhere near the site, while those who oppose it do. These are the people who have maintained this area as far back as the 30s to the present, paying significant property taxes and paying all the rules for the privilege of living on Lake Mendota with a degree of privacy living in Signal family homes. My family has been a resident of 1646 Sherman Avenue since 1934 when the home it seems, was surrounded by woods and there were lands occupied by the Sherman Terrace condominiums were a cornfield. Sherman Avenue is a two lane street located in a largely residential area. Those residents consist principally of single family homes on the west side of the street from the intersection of Sherman Avenue and Fordham Avenue to Tenney Park and single family residents on both sides of the street south of Tenney Park. On the east side of Sherman Avenue to the five lane building, there are a number of apartment complexes and or condominiums between Fordham Avenue and Yahara River with those bordering Sherman Avenue with the exception of the newly erected McKenzie Place limited to three stories and those bordering Fordham principally three and four stories. You have about 30 traffic seconds congestion, left, Robert. Traffic congestion has been an issue on Sherman Avenue for a considerable period of time and has progressively worsened over time. The recent addition of the Gordon and McKenzie Place on Sherman Avenue North have or north of the area have accelerated this issue and now with the addition of the newly constructed apartments of Aberg, Hartmeyer Project, and the plans for Oscar Meyer can only and that's one time. can only imagine. I'm Thank sorry? you, Robert. That's your time. Thank you. Our next registrant is Larry Nesper uh, of District 12, to be followed by Lindsay Lee, to be followed by Daniel Luchop. Am Larry? I audible? You are. Am I audible? Thank you. Good evening. The council is being asked to rezone 1617 Sherman to accommodate 331 rental apartments that are going to add at least 400 cars to largely residential two-lane Sherman Avenue, a street that then immediately runs through Tenney Park, well traversed by bicyclists, pedestrians, and fishermen all moving between the park, the jetty, 
and Filene Park. Buildings of this scale were too big for this site for the 2016 neighborhood plan that this council ratified, too big by 50%. To quote from an even earlier Yahara River Parkway plan for this area, new residential construction should create housing types and densities that are consistent with the existing housing adjacent to each redevelopment site. Each housing development should have an affordable housing component. The density is not consistent with adjacent existing housing, and there is no affordable component in it either. It's too bad that the city did not feel compelled to put some skin in the game, as it were, on this project and require some affordable housing. Rents will rise in the neighborhood and gentrification will proceed. At the planning commission meeting last week, Commissioner Cantrell said, we certainly need housing and this property is a perfect site for it. Is it perfect because of the distance residents will have to trek to grocery stores, pharmacies, coffee shops, restaurants, and other services, none of which are reasonable walking distance from 1617 Sherman? Maybe they'll take the bus. You must know that the current number two bus passes this property 18 times a day heading downtown and 18 times a day heading north. Did you know that the rapid the transit network redesign eliminates the number two and substitutes peak only service? that starts heading outbound and then loops back, this will not help deter people from using their cars. Is it a perfect site because the city is going to make the developer build a public street through the property? Here the hope is that the city will be able to redevelop the affordable housing at Yahara Landing and extend the street to where Fordham meets Johnson. So those added 400 cars won't be a problem in the long run. Since the Common Council was willing to set aside the unanimous recommendation of the Landmark Commission last month to make Filene House a landmark on this property, I'm hoping that you will amend the recommendation of the Plan Commission and reconsider the scale of this pr proposed development and all the implications of that. Thank you. Thank you. Our next registrant is Lindsay Lee of District 6, to be followed by Daniel Luchop, to be followed by... Mary Ellen Sporky. Lindsay? Hi. Uh, I'll try to keep my comments uh, short. Um, 26 years ago, I moved to Madison with my wife, Beth. Um, we've lived uh, for those 26 years on the isthmus. Uh, uh, I have built two retail businesses uh, on the isthmus. We raised uh, three kids on the isthmus. They're now all adults and have moved on, and hopefully someday we'll come back um, to our great city. Um, and for almost all of those years, I have supported increasing density, inviting more new neighbors uh, to our neighborhood here on the Isthmus. Um, just as we were warmly accepted uh, when we moved here, 26 years ago. Concerning uh, this site, it's a perfect site to have density. The history of urban parks is that they foremost serve those who do not have green space. I do have a house on a single uh, lot. Um, I do have a backyard, not a very big backyard, um, but I do have a backyard. Um, that I can retreat to and grill out on and, um, and, and enjoy. It's those who live in more dense uh, buildings, like apartment buildings, uh, who need uh, um, green space. Hence, you go to many cities and you see uh, a lot of density next to the park. And as you move away from the park in urban settings, you see less density. So this is a perfect site. It's a great project. It'll be great to have new neighbors. Uh, we need to continue to focus on housing. Uh, a lot of them will start families and will need different types of housing. Uh, we need to continue the focus and debate on housing, but this is a good project. I know you're gonna pass it. Um, and it's great that people want to move to Madison. I'm from Flint, Michigan, where people are leaving we should be really happy that people want to move to Madison, Wisconsin. Thank you. Thank you. Our next registrant is Daniel Luchop of District 12 to be followed by Mary Ellen Sporky to be followed by Harry Richardson. 
Daniel? Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hello, I oppose the zoning changes uh, under the current proposal. A change of zoning from suburban to residen residential under the current proposal only pushes the density beyond the limits without bringing any of the residential benefits to the community, not even the opportunity for ownership and not even for the new residents. Um, I think the proposal itself is contradictory. For instance, um, they justify the, the zoning change as follows. There are no nearby restaurants or other uses that employees could conveniently access. The parking lot is also larger than required. Uh, as a result, there are no incentives for people to drive to the site. Uh, the, the, as a result, there are incentives for people to drive to the site rather than taking alternative forms of transportation. So despite making these claims, what they do, they introduce additional 400 parking places and there is no room for restaurants or stores. And it seems to me that there are more incentives for people to drive and for even more people. So right now, my 17 year, 79 year old mother takes the bus to Woodman's for affordable shopping. And she will still have to do that. But now in a more crowded bus because the new residents will have no other place to go for residential shopping either. Furthermore, uh, I'm not sure about the effect on the environment. We all may remember the flooding from 2018 where much of the Tenney Park and uh, Sherman Terrace was under inches of water. It is unclear how this new development will solve, uh, will work under the similar situations. The request for amendment to the Madison General Ordinance claims there is no fiscal impact. But I think there is, if all this, if I understand this correctly, if all these uh, amenities will have to be provided for the new people, this will definitely have a fiscal impact. Uh, yeah, uh, other than that, I think the other people uh, pretty clearly justify the additional uh, uh, oppositions. I think that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Our next registration is Mary Ellen Sporky of District 6 to be followed by Harry Richardson, to be followed by Joan Johnson. Mary? Thank you. I'm speaking in opposition to the Vermilion development. Um, I've written my opposition to the Urban Design Committee, the Plan Commission, and also registered in support of the landmark status for the Filene House, all of which seems to be little or no avail. I live on Marston Avenue, One, it's a one block street and an emergency thoroughfare which borders Tenney Park. Like many of our neighbors here, I feel a development of this size is too huge for the lot size and the character of our neighborhood. We've discussed with various committees the adverse effects, many of which you've heard, so I won't even go into those now, but traffic, noise, um, deleterious effects to the wildlife living in the area and migrating birds, difficulties with emergency vehicles, accessing Sherman, all of that. With that said, I do appreciate Madison's need for housing, but this development is rental only with no affordable housing and no pathway to first time home ownership, which I believe is a priority or a concern of our mayor. It is strictly rental for individuals with large enough incomes to afford the high prices of these units. And I ask, where's the commitment to community, schools, green space, and overall quality of life when people do not have a vested interest in home ownership and in creating a viable, livable community? Many of us moved into housing on the east side when it was not the most desirable place in Madison to live. Yes, houses were more affordable then, but we were committed to creating a strong community where we could raise our children, support their schools, and help small businesses thrive. As a neighborhood, so many individuals also worked with the city to preserve what is lovely here, bike paths, pedestrian walkways, and particularly our historic Tenney Park and Yahara River Parkway. 
I would like to read briefly what one neighbor, Kevin Rovalitsky, wrote in his opposition to this development. Daniel Tenney, James Olin, and the Madison Park and Pleasure Drive Association had foresight and understood the importance of preserving this area already back in 1899. And here we are allow, considering allowing apartments for the privilege to rise into the view so that the rest of the community from all walks of life will lose that beautiful surrounding green view, that unforgettable sense of place. This is no small matter. There are many of us who saved our sanity during the pandemic by strolling amid this insulated green space. And that's time. And I- I want to ask you. Thank Madison. you, Mary. That's your time. Our next registrant is Harry Richardson of District 6, to be followed by Joan Johnson, to be followed by Dave Grace. Harry? Hi. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Real good. Yeah, so I uh, live in the neighborhood. Uh, I've lived in the neighborhood for 16 years within uh, the Tenney Park area in, in Madison for over 40 years now. And uh, this is not a good development not a good fit for the city this is a, a development that's making money for outside developers that will not money will not stay in the community it will not benefit people that live here it does not provide affordable housing as other as number of other speakers have already noted which should uh, by rights be a big priority of any kind of development and it is not um in a <laughs> it's just too high and too dense if they they should build building something that is closer in line to the Sherman Terrace uh, next door, and there should definitely be a, a, an affordable housing co- component. It's also unfortunate to take out some uh, really nice trees along either side of the, this route. Uh, I hope that the council would reconsider uh, this proposal and reject it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next registrant is Joan Johnson of District 12, to be followed by Dave Grace to be followed by Bronwyn Schiffer. Do we have Joan? Don't appear to have- There's no one by that name in attendance. Okay, thank you. What about Dave Grace of District 6? To be followed by Bronwyn Schiffer, to be followed by Peter Cullen. Dave? Yes, I'm here. This is the eighth meeting that I've attended regarding this project, and I'd like to briefly recap for the council the recurring themes that I've heard. This is a unique and amazing site. Two, it should be developed for housing. Three, the current developer has made progress from the initial design ideas, but the current proposal for this site is meh for all the reasons that Larry Nesper from Sherman Terrace Association mentioned and others. I've heard the developer ask dozens of questions throughout all these meetings about pollinators, green roofs, the history of walking circles, and of course, those two darn maple trees out front. I've heard the developer ask once, just once, about incorporating affordable housing, into which they said it was not within their financial model and they could not share their financial model. These are luxury rentals that do nothing to solve our housing crisis in Madison, unless, of course, you buy into the idea of trickle-down housing. I know we live in a capitalist society, but if the developer wants two major approvals here tonight, demolition of a historic building and rezoning, then we need to ask for more. The Common Council has been in overdrive approving 4,000 units last year, so you're now two to four times ahead of where you need to be. You have space, you have slack, to look at making the section 42 housing, which it would likely qualify for, see if maybe the developer can offset the inclusion of affordable units with high rent Lakeview units, or think more creatively about this site like co-housing. Rentals and items for purchase are both needed, but 6% of the units that are now called townhomes in this proposal are still rentals. They're, They're not purchase items and they will keep citizens at the mercy of rent increases. Let's make sure this great location meets its potential, not with a plaque to credit union history in the city, but rather with affordable housing that ensures at least 10 or 20% or more 
of these units are affordable so that community members across a range of incomes have a chance to live in this beautiful space. Thank you. Thank you. Our next registrant is Bronwyn Schiffer of District 12, to be followed by Peter Cullen, to be followed by William Butcher. We have Bronwyn. Hi. Yes, hi, thank you. Um, I'm a resident of Sherman Terrace, direct neighbor to the proposed development. Um, regarding the preservation of green space, um, there are woodland pockets around the entire perimeter of this property. I'm very pleased with the requirement for a 30 foot buffer of trees on the south border of the property. I ask that you consider requiring that the development protect all of the existing perimeter green space. Not only do these woodland uh, pockets support the health of the Yohara Parkway and Tunney Park, but would also add significant aesthetic and health value for future residents of the proposed development and all neighbors. Um, urban green spaces are vital to the health of both the city of Madison and its residents, and once destroyed are difficult to recreate. In keeping with the city of Madison's rich historical commitment to preserving urban green spaces, the city should add an amendment to the current proposal to require that these areas be maintained. Thank you for your continued work to support the residents of Madison. Thank you. Our next registrant is Peter Cullen of District 12, to be followed by William Butcher, to be followed. Oh, that's our last speaker. Peter? Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. And thank you for this opportunity. I'm slightly distant from the area, but have lived on Sherman Avenue off and on for over 50 years, from grad school in the 70s to my sister, uh, helping my sister, who is a next door almost resident of uh, Robert Johnson. I'm extremely offended by the fact that with all the development you see going on in Madison, predominantly by a, a long-term Madison resident or Madison company, Findorf, John Findorf, that you don't see anything related to Madison with the exception of Potter Laudison, who should be ashamed. Briefly, if, if you consider this, I would like you to think about a movie you may or may not have seen where Matthew McConaughey is defending a black man accused of killing two assailants of his daughter, assailants, rapists, etc., And he wins over the jury by asking them to close their eyes and say, and he describes this awful assault and said, now imagine she's white. I'm asking members of the council, imagine this is going in across the street from your residence. It does not fit. Madam Mayor, you're an east side resident close to where I live, you wouldn't like five stories like this across the street any more than any resident in Madison would. And if you do not turn this down, any resident in Madison can expect the same thing. One of the things I find most interesting is on the website from their 15th or 16th floor on Walker Drive in Chicago, there's no reference to wonderful developments in Chicago. It's big places where they're building student housing in Indiana or Illinois, uh, excuse me, down in, in Champaign-Urbana or Illinois State or wherever. They are, like many Illinois residents, viewing Wisconsin as a whole as real estate to do with what they please. The last thing I would say is very little has been said about the heat reflection of the construction materials, the same as the less than quality materials and all these white mushrooms going up throughout the town. The last place that used brick, I think it must have been leftover, and it was at the corner of uh, Milwaukee and East Wash. Everything else is paneled. That's not brick, it's paneled. And it reflects the heat, just as East Washington reflects that's the time. heat. Thank you. That's your time. Thank you. Our uh, final registrant, late breaking, is Jim Schusler of District 12. Do we have Jim? Uh, this is William. Am I up? Oh, I'm sorry. 
Yes, go ahead, William Butcher of District 6. Thank you. And then uh, we'll go to Jim Schuschler. Uh, I support the project for a few reasons. Um, it reflects the uh, intent, design, and density of the, the 2016 Emerson E. Contenia Harbor Neighborhood Plan. I think that's important because the purpose of those pretty intensive public engagements that involve neighbors, uh, the public and city planning staff is to craft a future plan that guides the city, uh, property owners, and potential future stakeholders. Uh, the process works, and I think preserving its integrity is extremely important. Uh, two, the second reason is the commonly cited housing crisis. While there's no singular solution, I think everyone can agree that limiting housing supply will not help, and adding supply will help to whatever extent that is. Uh, adding housing on the isthmus, uh, on and near major transportation, including um, not just bus, but bike and pedestrian access, and this is excellent for those, uh, both to the downtown and commercial employment areas is all the more valuable. Um, lastly, on this specific project, it's undergone a few major revisions in design, density, and infrastructure, you know, includes now a city street, the traffic and engineering desired, uh, public element with the memorialization of the history of the site, and uh, I think like a 20-year uh, uh, park agreement or buffer agreement, you know, to be done in conjunction with city parks, you know, all that combined with, you know, having received a unanimous approval of plan commission and unanimous support from every city department, um, you know, speaks well to uh, the engagement process so far. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Right, now, I believe our final registrant is Jim Schusler of District 12. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, great. Yeah, I'm traveling with my family along a highway in Italy right now, so I wasn't sure I was going to be able to connect, so that's nice. So I just want to make a couple of quick comments. Um, one, um, I, from day one, have felt that this project was completely appropriate. I find Madison Parks to be uh, utterly unutilized, and I'm delighted by the notion that so many people could live near the park and the lake and enjoy those amenities. And I think that is a fantastic thing. I think Madison Park should be enjoyed by more and more people than they are today, rather than being used for homeless encampments. And uh, so I think that that is a huge plus. Number two, I would like to say that I completely subscribe to the notion of trickle down housing. When you add housing, whether it be luxury or affordable, you are adding to the housing stock, and that will have an effect on affordable housing. Anytime you add units to the market, you are relieving pressure and creating more units for other people to occupy. And finally, I would like to add that I would hope that perhaps the city would add a dog park to Tenney Park to accommodate the residents of this beautiful new project. Those are my comments, thank you. Thank you. That is all of our registrations on item five, wishing to speak. Are there questions for any of the registrants? If not, oh, Alder Foster. Yeah, I just wanted to confirm. It looked like there was a Cheryl who had wanted to speak, and it looks like there's someone in the participant list with their hand up with the same name. She was our first registrant. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Alder Vitiver. Um, I'm sorry, I have forgotten the names of the gentlemen from the project, but I do have a couple of questions for them. <laughs> okay, if we could have the development team back, please. Oh, I was fine close, with that but I'd be happy to give you the last few words. <clears throat> All right, so if we can get the slides back. Do you want the slides back? Um, I think we were on the last slide. I, I, the, the sentence that I didn't finish was just that the compliance with the, the Emerson East, Eakin Park, Yahara neighborhood plan, as well as comprehensive plan, as well as um, I'm probably missing one, imagine... Imagine Madison. Imagine Madison, thank you. We're all, we feel we're in compliance or, or um, uh, with all of those and that we just feel that this project is a, is a small step towards the solution of the housing challenges that Madison has. That would have been my final statement. All right, 
Thank you, Alder Bennett. Uh, Alder Vitiver, questions? Yeah. Um, so are the townhouses going to be available for purchase? They are not technically for purchase. No, they are not. Uh, they are for rent. They were a previously, in a previous iteration of the project, they were apartments. And we had heard from the community that larger family style <laughs> residential units were in in really high demand. And so the townhomes were a an attempt to helping solve some of that demand, which are two and three bedroom. They live like single family residences. And would you consider making them for purchase? Um, not currently, and I only say that because, um, well, we have, um, we, <laughs> I'll say not currently, but only because we've had challenges in the past with previous condominium projects that we've developed. And so it, it has left a, 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 it's a difficult situation to get a project like this financed with different parts that would be for rent or for sale. Okay. Um, and is there a reason that it is not mixed use? That it's not mixed use? Yes, that, is not, that there are no businesses located on the development. Um, just, just demand when we first started working with the, the commercial, started talking to commercial brokers here in the city to try and understand if there was demand for a project like this, we quickly realized that perhaps a coffee shop, perhaps a, a, a Pilates studio, there was, there was opportunities for very singular one-off types of retail uses, um, maybe an ice cream store. Like the, you can think of the types of uses that would be really dynamic and interesting for perhaps six months out of the year in that location, but it just, um, it wasn't enough to, to allow the design to kind of take on that mixed use component. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Um, Alder Carter. Uh, two questions. One is, do you have, um, a PowerPoint of where the park is located and where the development is. I didn't see that, so I don't know if you had one or not. I think we can get the site back up for oh, you, Alder. Thank you. And then my second question, thank you very much. My second question is how many, um, in your experience, um, mixed use, Developments have empty storefronts. Uh, Alder, is that a question for the development team or for yeah, staff? Yeah, yeah, in their no, in, in development team, in their experience of building apartments, etc. Um, I can speak to. So um, we were sort of mischaracterized earlier. The work we primarily do is in assisted living, primarily affordable assisted living. Oh. Um, okay. We do apartment development and we have done condominium development historically that we have one mixed use project in the city of Chicago that is fully leased uh, from a retail standpoint. Um, and we did develop a project in the Hyde Park neighborhood of Chicago that also was fully leased when the university actually purchased that project. They were a partner of ours, it, it sort of convoluted, but that was also fully leased. So in our experience, we've had very good experience leasing the retail as a component of a mixed use project. Okay, thank you for that. And now I see where the park is compared to your site. So thank you very much for that, Heather. Thank you, Alder. Alder Heck. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this is for Darren. Uh, I I may need to act, ask uh, staff about it too later, but I thought I'd give you a shot. Um, if we look at the site plan again, that might be helpful. Um, I'm interested in in pedestrian, bike, and bus access for folks, and it came up in public comment. Could you just describe maybe based on that site plan? how all three of those modes will get access to bike paths, to bus service, and, and that, just so we're clear. So from a pedestrian standpoint, obviously, it's through the, the um, sidewalk network that would be on any of the major streets, um, including through the project. Um, bike, 
bike is going to be on Sherman. It's going to be along the Yahara, um, kind of picking up through Tenney Park and then connecting to the bike trail that's along the Yahara and then through, you know, throughout the entire city from that, from that point. Um, bus, and I might have to ask for Melissa's help on this, but I think bus is essentially to the north. Uh, right in front of Tenney Place, uh, there's a bus stop currently, and yeah, that's the closest bus stop I can think of. So the improvement to uh, Madison Network, uh, um, Metro Network, um, will include um, increasing all of the buses on Johnson to every 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. So it's you will now have a regular bus stop. That is a bit of a walk. So during peak hours, um, Metro has added a circulator that will um, circulate um, along the same <clears throat> area in Sherman Avenue that the current bus line goes. So during you know peak peak rush hour, the sort of seven to nine and four to seven um, hours, there will be bus service directly in front of there. And then otherwise, there will be much more frequent bus service uh, along Johnson than there is now. And then, of course, the um, bus rapid transit is three quarters of a mile on East Washington, East Wash. Thank, thank you. Melissa, could you, could you just uh, describe how people will access the bus then? There's, there's one, the, the circulator you mentioned will be at the front of the, near the front of the building right. yeah. on the lake side, and otherwise people will need to go to Fordham Johnson on the pedestrian uh, network yes. or through the back of the site. Right, so th through the goat, the goat paths that are already there, um, that people already use, will go to, to Fordham. Um, and then along the, the bike path along the Yahara River, will also connect you into Johnson. Okay. Um, so, so there are exi existing um, pathways for people to reach the buses. Okay, thank you. Just uh, another question, uh, prob it might be for Doug, but it might be for Darren. At Plan Commission, we had a lengthy discussion of uh, the sustainability features that are being included in this proposed project. Can you just kind of quickly go over a few of those? I'm gonna change it even further and, and suggest maybe Carrie comes up. Carrie, are you okay answering that question? I'm, and I'm, I'm particularly interested in the heat pump pot and potential for geothermal usage that, that you described. Um, sure. Yeah, so I'm Kerry Dixon with Vermilion Development, and um, you know, sustainability is something that we focus on on all of our projects, and specifically the question about heat pumps and a geothermal transfer transfer field. Um, there's a new program that was created by the federal government, the Inflation Reduction Act, which is set up to um, provide incentives for um, energy efficiency and. Um, we're looking at that program as a way to um, support the financial investment in those types of technologies, which would take the building away from fossil fuels and into more of an, an electric type of system, and um, also being able to use uh, a heat transfer system with the geothermal field. Thanks. And I guess the other features are up on the screen, so maybe it's not worth reading those. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can read them, but it's it's all about technology to a certain extent. You know, smart thermostats, energy um, star appliances, you know, lead light fixtures or LED light fixtures, and then, you know, being able to control the fixtures with occupancy sensors so that the lights aren't on in the, in the garage 24-7, the lights aren't on in the stairwell when no one's using them. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank sorry, you. sorry, Mayor, just one more question. Uh, this is probably uh, for Darren. I, I want to make sure we understand the, the buffer between the development and uh, Tenney Park. I, I believe the buffer is on the east side of the river, uh, which is technically part of the park, but it's not on what we typically think of as the park side of the river, correct? Correct. You can you can see it here to a certain extent. You, you might be familiar with the boat parking 
lot that runs on the north side of the Yahar River. That's part of the park property. You can see the dotted property line where this site begins. And on our property for the initial 30 feet, there is this vegetated buffer that has been crafted in tandem with the parks department. Um, it, is, it is an agreement whereby for the next 20 years, that area will remain untouched except for what I would call routine maintenance as trees fall or if they are sick and need to be um, removed, then we will work and we're working through an agreement right now with the parks department to, to manage that area as though it's in the same vegetative space as Tenney Park, meaning it's, it's going to be planted with or trees will be replaced with um, all of the same vegetation that is approved as part of the historical landscape plan for Tenney Park. Thanks, so and, and, that, and that 30 feet begins uh, on your side of the right. existing parking lot, so it's substantially far away from the river. I, maybe I heard a number in your original presentation, 100 feet or something from uh, the that, river. That or? is referencing, it, it's listed as building C here. That's referencing that building's distance from ah, the okay. line. So Got it. you'll see the 30 foot vegetative buffer. Then there's this bioswale detention pond then against the building are the community gardens, and then you'll see building C. Thanks. And then if, if you move to the other side, the, the buffer between Sherman Terrace and the townhomes, what does that consist of? That consists of maintaining the, as many of the existing trees as we can, or, or that won't be disrupted through the construction process, and replanting Thanks. as part of our landscape plan for the entire site. And, and those townhouses are two-story structures, whereas Sherman Terrace is three stories, correct? Correct. Great, okay, thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Paulson. Yes, it's for Darren, but maybe uh, you may want to kick it to someone on your development team. Um, 10, 15 years ago, Madison uh, used to talk about, uh, when we were building apartments, we would talk about building the condo standards. Um, uh, because we were thinking sometimes these apartments would eventually transition to condos. And actually there were a couple apartment complexes that did get converted uh, into condos just down the street on Johnson Street uh, at the old pump uh, station. Uh, I lived in that building now, I forget what the heck it's called. Um, but they were apartments 2007-ish and then they became uh, condos. And there were a couple other examples where we kept building these buildings, but we used the term built to condo standards. Um, implying potentially uh, a, a changeover. And I don't know if that's a, a term of the art um, uh, or if it was just a, a way to say, hey, we're going to try to spend a little bit more on some soundproofing. Um, but I'm curious uh, if you've, and this is building off uh, uh, Alder Viterver's uh, questions, if that had ever come up in your discussions, uh, thinking ahead, have you built out what needs to be done, um, either just from a marketing standpoint, or if there are any other uh, standards that uh, maybe uh, Freddie or Fanny have on, on what you'd need to have in a uh, in a building to be able to turn into uh, condominiums uh, and just wonder if you could talk about that. Yeah, I, I can talk to it. This is Carrie Dixon again with Vermillion. Um, I spent my career to a certain extent doing condominiums um, and th there isn't really a difference between the quality level of what we are proposing here and a, and a condominium. Um, you reference sound isolation and being able to um, kind of make it so that you can't hear from apartment to apartment the same types of technologies from a building perspective that you would use in a condominium or being used in this apartment. Um, same thing with the quality of the mechanical systems, smart thermostats and things like that are to a certain extent quality level, you know, single family home types of um, finishes and types of technologies. So if you know, it would be easy to convert this to an apartment in the future if somebody wanted to, if the, you know, investment group that owned it wanted to. Do a kind of, yeah. Okay. I say apartment. Yeah. Well, starting an apartment, but there's no reason why it couldn't be converted. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Wahili. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This is for the developers and. My question is based on a question raised by the public comment, and there are three different questions. One question is, uh, can you talk about the difficulty in accessing uh, ambulance uh, in these uh, facilities? 
Uh, the second question would be, uh, are they open to uh, adding more green space? And then the third question is, if they can talk about more about the heat reflection on the materials. The first question was about ambulance access. Was that correct? Mm -hmm. um, obviously, uh, well, I thank you for the question. Sherman is um, clearly accessible public road. The standards by which the new street that has been designed as part of this project in tandem with the um, engineering department here in Madison is also designed to be eventually a thoroughfare um, through to Fordham. And, and that is absolutely designed for um, the standards of the city of Madison. Um, I, I hope that's answering your question. Yes, one of the uh, uh, um, presidents um, implied, say that, that it, it would be difficult for the medical uh, ambulance to have access to those facility. So I'm just curious as if that's the case, if not, then perhaps that answered my question. Yeah, I understood her comment to be um, more about some place that wasn't on our site. But as Darren referenced, um, you know, the Department of Transportation has been, you know, working with us on our plan and the design for the street and the design for emergency vehicles around the buildings. So um, we've satisfied their questions, and they're typically concerned about emergency vehicles and things like that. So I, I think we've satisfied the city in that regard. Okay, thank you. And the other question is, are you open to adding more green space? Um, yeah, I think the, the whole process that we've gone through as we've been working on these buildings has been to um, increase the amount of green space on the site. Um, we, we've kind of landed at what we feel is a very good place in that regard, but um, over the course of the design of the project and our neighborhood meetings, we've um, substantially reduce the number of parking spaces that are outside of the buildings and put them in structured parking within the buildings. And the majority of the parking for the town, well, the townhomes has parking within the townhome structure itself. The other two buildings have two floors of structured parking that's covered by the green roof. And um, all of that space that was given up to parking previously is now green space. And then the stormwater detention areas, which uh, the site plan's not up, but there's a significant, there's actually two different stormwater detention systems on the site, one for um, the residential apartments and one for the public road. And all of those are, are now green spaces, uh, I'll say it again, planted with native plants that um, support pollinators. Um, so the, a, a lot of the design of the buildings as we've been going through the neighborhood process has been to in, increase green space. And then I, I think your last question was about um, the uh, heat reflection the, materials. Yeah, the building materials reflecting heat. Um, we okay. talked about that in the plan commission. Um, the chair asked about our roof, and um, I confirmed to her that um, we'll be using white roofs. We'll be using high albedo roofs, which are reflective as opposed to a black roof, which is um, going to absorb heat and reflect it back into the atmosphere. Um, he, he also referenced um, kind of lack of brick on buildings, so I'd like to respond to that too, where um, we have a significant amount of brick on the townhomes and the multi-story buildings. It's focused in um, certain portions of the design, primarily on the ground floor of the higher buildings, and then um, it, like one of the most recent changes was adding more brick to the townhomes in the in the building B2. So um, I'm not quite sure where the question comes from, but I don't think that um, our materials are going to reflect heat. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Uh, Alder Bennett. Yeah, so I, I understand that you were saying that most of the developments you work on are assisted living and like affordable rents, I believe you said. So, but this is not that, this is a market rate development. Correct, yes. Correct. Yeah. We, um, we have a, a um, we have developed a number of affordable assisted living communities that utilize 4% uh, 
uh, yeah. light tech financing. Sure. Um, so we're very familiar with tax credit financing and affordable housing and the creation of affordable housing, mainly on, on, in the senior space. Um, mm -hmm. And this is not in a qualified census tract, which puts it at a disadvantage from a financing perspective. So the mechanism by which affordable housing is financed is not available to this particular project. Um, I, I'd further add, you know, the creation of this road is at an expense to the project as well. So it kind of puts that potential a little further out of reach. Sure, that makes sense. Um, and I'm wondering to some of my elders, fellow colleagues questions about what um, purchasing did you say like you wouldn't be interested in uh, adding a purchase option later on down the road like 10 15 years <laughs> I, I guess I'd go on the record as saying we'd never say never but at, at this point at least in terms of how the project is intended to be financed it's not it's not set up so that the, the purchase of those units is a potential today Oh, okay, I see. I was wondering if you did, would you consider using like a lease to purchase per program so that the current rents being paid could be eventually maybe put towards purchasing the apartment or condo? Would, would we look at that? Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, and then I'm also wondering, I know that this changed a bit from like an urban design commission level. I'm wondering how did you incorporate um, the committee recommendate or the commission recommendations into the final design that you presented to us? Oh, in, in many ways. Um, I'd almost have to, I, I wish I could pull forward a, a, a drawing of the previous design. Yeah. The, the, the building was, the, the main building that's on Sherman Avenue was previously turned so that it had six stories of residences looking out over Lake Mendota, which we envisioned as being fantastic. Like this is, this is views of one of the most beautiful lakes in the Midwest. And, and we really thought that was valuable. It didn't come across as valuable to the broader community or to the Urban Design Commission. So we had to retreat to our corners and redesign. And, and the redesign was to engage the street of Sherman Avenue with the building in a different way. So we created walk-up residential units, so essentially apartments that you could walk up in your front doors there on Sherman Avenue or on the New Street. Mm -hmm. The scale of the majority of that frontage on Sherman Avenue is now only one story instead of the six stories that it was previously. There are two four-story wings to the building that step back to five stories, but the height of the building in general is 15 or so feet shorter. Um, one story, um, it's, um, it's, it's, a completely, I won't say a completely different building, but it's a much different building um, with a green roof that faces out onto uh, Sherman Avenue versus this kind of um, stronger presence um, that was there previously. Okay, I see. Thank you. And just like out of curiosity, did the redesign of the building layout change the amount of units you could have? It didn't change the amount we could have. The amount we could have was really dictated by the zoning category that we've been um, pursuing, mm. and really by hearing the amount of demand for housing in Madison was, was also a driver. What, what we responded to was how to, how to design buildings that fit with the scale of the neighborhood and also responded to the neighborhood in that they wanted less density here. So it was a balancing act between what we felt the project could support and what we felt the neighborhood was willing to support. Sure. Okay, thank you. It, it, yeah, to Carrie's point, it did change the number of units by, oh, um, almost 25%, I think, in reduction. 25% reduction. Yeah, I think we were at 445 in our first design and we were at 331 units today. Mm, that's over 100, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alder. I have no other Alders in the queue for questions. So we'll go on to our next item. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, our next, uh, and I believe final item for public comment is uh, item number 103, the second substitute, authorizing the city of Madison to develop comprehensive response to the crisis in home health care. And it's not the final item, sorry. Uh, our first registrant is Karen Foxgrover of District 4, to be followed by Amanda Zauner, to be followed by Jason Belongi. Karen? 
Yes, thank you. My name Karen Foxgrover. I live in downtown Madison, and my current address is UW Hospital East. My I have a disability, and I've been a, a pretty active member of the community in Madison, and my alder knows me very well. Um, I have spinal muscular atrophy, a type of muscular dystrophy, and I've been living with that disability since I was born. And over the time of my life, it's got, I've gotten weaker and weaker and require more and more personal care. And I've been doing self-directed care my whole life. And I am just overwhelmed by the needs that have been growing and, and people not really taking a real handle on how to deal with them. Um, the personal care crisis is is exploding. And I have, as I said, I've been self-directed since I moved to Madison in the 80s. And um, I was working with many different companies, but I was still doing mostly my own directive. I hire my own people, et cetera. And one day, when the agency I was working with decided to quit and that put me into a spin, but I found other agencies and I found um, people I could hire and it was working, but then it was just harder and harder. My need is very high because as I said, I have a, a, a disability that grows. I mean, my weakness grows. And so I need a lot of help and I was uh, put in the hospital in March of 22 with pneumonia. And so I was unable to really attack this need at that time. And it caught up with me. Um, an agency, Angels at Home, took on helping me as an agency. And it was amazing. They were so excited, but they only had two people to help me. I usually have eight to 10 people helping me. And these people were not very well trained to deal with someone with a severe disability. You have and, about 30 and, seconds left. Oh, well. Well, anyway, what I'm saying is I've been, I'm currently living in a hospital because I am since November. And it is real, really overwhelming to me that there is just nowhere to look or nowhere to go for help. And agencies are really, really unable to provide care workers. I just really need someone to take a lead on yeah, this. Time. And we will help. Thank you. That's your time. Yes. Our next registrant is Amanda Zauner of Milwaukee, to be followed by Jason Belange, to be followed by Ash Vetter. We have Amanda. Hi, this is Amanda. Go ahead. Um, my name is Amanda Zauner, and I graduated from UW-Madison with a Bachelor's of Science um, degree in Nutritional Sciences um, back in 2019. And while I was in school at UW-Madison, three of my four years, I worked as a personal caregiver for Barbara Butter. Um, personal caregiving and home care in general has really like shaped how I like proceeded with my career planning and will like I'll those are experiences I'll carry with me as a provider of healthcare as a PA. Um I'm expected to like graduate in May from Marquette University. That being said, I think that there should be a real um move in terms of like compensating and um, recruiting, recruiting home health care providers um, because it's like there is a need that's very desperate out there. And I'm here today personally for Barbara Vetter and to promote the accessibility of personal care workers to aid in people's lives like Barbara Vetter someone who's like strongly involved in community. And I believe everyone should has a, have that right to be involved in their community. And for people with um, disabilities that requires like home health care. And that means like high quality 
people who actually take their time and care and listen to their clients and but that requires like more payment um, and more resources overall for the city of Madison. And I truly believe that the city of Madison should strive to provide for everyone. Um, yeah. Thank you. Our next registrant is Jason Belanger of Milwaukee Street to be followed by Ash Fetter to be followed by Erica Bach. Jason? All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Jason Belongi, the Executive Director of Access to Independence, located in Madison, which is an organization that provides advocacy, resources, and services to people of all types of disabilities and all ages. And I wanted to speak tonight in support of Alder Vetter's resolution. Uh, while I don't believe that the resolution will completely solve the issue of the workforce care crisis, I do think that it provides an opportunity for the city to uh, engage in some solutions toward the issue. The long-term care workforce crisis has been worsening for several years and is now at a point that threatens the systems that fund and provide those services and the freedom and independence of those who rely on them. Even in Madison, which is often considered to be resource rich, there are too many people with disabilities who cannot find workers for some or all of their shifts, there are too many people. Uh, there are also providers who cannot find workers to fill shifts for their clients. And there's families who are providing care to a level that impacts their employment and their well being. The bulk of the solution does rest with the state and the federal government to address the rates paid for these services, as well as other barriers that are driving people away from the workforce. That said, something must be done while we wait on those solutions. The impact of the crisis is real, and in the written testimony I provided, I shared a graphic that outlined a few key areas I wanted to touch on real briefly. Uh, in the survey done by the Survival Coalition of Disability Organizations, they note that uh, of respondents with disabilities, 38% have been missing employment or had to leave employment altogether. 26% have missed on medications or medical treatments. 22% have had to have changes in their housing, and you heard Karen Foxgrover just now talk about that as a real situation for her. 17% uh, have been confined in their bed all day. 26% have missed meals, and 24% missed other medical appointments. None of us should be content knowing that our family, friends, and neighbors are not entitled to the same basic rights and opportunities as the rest of us. I truly believe that the resolution offers, offers a starting point to identify ways the city can help, and I strongly encourage the council to support the resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Our next registrant is Eshnatan Vetter of District 6, to be followed by Erica Bach, to be followed by Lucianne Matheron. Esh? Yes, good evening, and uh, thank you for hearing our testimony. Um, I, as well, support this resolution. I think it's a good starting point. Um, I have a very personal uh, story <clears throat> that goes along with this, obviously, as many of you know, um, being Barbara Vetter's son. Um, she, her, her accident happened when I was still four years old. Um, and so basically it's been my life experience um, having a mother with a very serious disability. And there's all kinds of different things that, that, uh, that has influenced. Um, but one thing that's been very clear is that the quality of personal care attendance, people who come and help take care of her basic needs is extremely important to her welfare. And it was extremely important to my welfare and to my father's welfare and other family members and, you know, friends as well. I, um, it has gotten, yeah, it's basically at a breaking point um, with our particular family. It's been three days a week that she has had somebody to come and help in the mornings and then 
other mornings, just an hour and a half of help, not even really taking care of the bare minimum. And then at night, nobody to come. So that all falls on my father. And has I have been going and helping a lot as well. Um, this is not our story. I mean, it, well, yes, it is our story. It's not only our story. This is the vast majority of people in this situation. It's the family members that it falls to. It doesn't have to be that way. This resolution can help to push us in that direction to have the the folks coming, you know, workers being able to, to help relieve the burdens that are falling on families. Um, you have all the statistics, um, you know, it's atrocious. Um, this time of year with the, the equinox, you know, makes me think of balance a balance right you have same amount of sun and dark well there is no balance in our community in our state in our nation and probably throughout the world as it goes as it comes to people with disabilities life is out of balance in such a way that people are not getting the care that they deserve and need, and we need to be part of that solution. Another thing, this time of year, today is my daughter's birthday. It, it, you, I, you're about out of time, Ash. Okay. <laughs> Thinking for future generations that you know this will be the first step to making our community more of a supportive community for all. Thank you. Thank you. Our next tradition is Erica Bach of Middleton to be followed by Lucienne Matheron. Do you have Erica? Mayor, there is no one in attendance by that name. Thank you. All right, so Lucienne Matheron of District 12. Luciano, either side is fine. Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to speak on this issue. <laughs> My name is Lucien Clément Matoron, a.k.a. Luciano, and some friend call me the wife of the famous politician. <laughs> I forget how stressful that position is. 42 years ago, I suddenly become, not even knowing it at the time, a family caregiver. I found myself in a foreign country with a five-year-old kid and a woman paralyzed with no feeling from the chest down. It's been a beautiful but rough journey. And thanks to many, many people, we made it so far. However, I am 76 years old. I'm exhausted. I'm feeling alone and somewhat in despair. I see our situation deteriorating very rapidly with some disastrous effect on our health, our relationship, and our life. The number of people in this situation, or worse, is growing. We know they exist, but we don't see them. You don't see them. Because the city-county building the theater, the bar, the restaurant, they can, make, they can be made wheelchair accessible. But if a person with disability don't get help in the morning to get up, you won't see her. She won't come here. And, and when that happens, people with disability lose their ability to live in their home the community lose their positive contribution to society. Family members who pick up the slack lose their ability to sustain gainful employment, to engage in recreational activity, to travel or take vacation. Some people have rightfully pointed out 
that this health care crisis is also a civil right issue. When calling the different agencies that provide service to people with disability, we found out that most do not take new clients, but some take clients with disability that do not require some specific service. And as per you, the specificity. The imbalance between the offer and demand on personal care workers gave some unreasonable power to the providing agency over people with disability who have to accept less than time. medically recommended care because Luciano, little care that's your time, might I'm be sorry. better than not care at all. Please pass this resolution so we can get to work. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, last uh, registrant on this item is Joe Frost of District 3. Do we have Joe? Yep, I'm here. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so uh, I'm uh, another um, individual with spinal muscular atrophy that's lived in Madison since 2008. I also serve on the Disability Rights Commission, and we've heard, you know, um, the testimony from Alder Vedder and many of the others here tonight. And uh, this is a very important subject, you know, even since I moved down here in 20, 2008, um, I've rarely had full coverage. And right now it's down to about 25 or 30 percent coverage with some of my very generous staff just taking on extra shifts. But just to even give some ideas and some glimmers of hope, you know, even though it's limited, as um, uh, Jason Belongi noted, what the city can do. Um, some things that may help immediately would be um, get, giving students um, better access to bus passes, to um, waiving parking fees. Uh, many of my caregivers over the years were local UW students, and just sometimes the financial burdens of you know parking fees or fear of their car getting towed were some things that you know the city might just be able to start looking into right away, you know, and discussing. And in addition to possibility, there has been some discussion with the Disability Rights Commission of if, you know, there could be um, help with rental assistance or some other initiatives. So I just want to thank everyone for hearing this testimony tonight and just want to um, share that this is a very important subject and we're, we the disabled, um, citizens of Madison, you know, are eager and glad to be a part of the community. In fact, you know, you'll see many of us out in the summer, especially for concerts on the square. So um, thank you for your time and thank you for hearing me out. Thank you. Are there questions for any of our registrants on item 103? Alder Madison? Uh, thanks, Mayor. I just wanted to ask for more time. I believe her first name was Karen. Hmm. Yes, uh, Karen Foxgrover, if Karen's still with us. I am here. Do you want to finish your comments? Oh, I would just love to. Um, my, the challenges were grand beyond comprehension because I was too sick to hire new people because of a, an episode of pneumonia. And then this one agency, Angels at Home, decided to take on my care needs but they were so short staffed and so ill prepared that it just didn't work. And in November of 2022, on the 23rd of November, the day before Thanksgiving, I was admitted to Meritor Hospital. And um, everybody, the whole agency staff just quit because of the holidays coming up. And then after Meritor, Meritor said, you got to get out of here before Christmas. So on the 23rd of December, they moved me to a nursing home. And they were very, very overwhelmed. And they had too many people and very short staffed. It was very difficult. And no one really knew anything about my disability. So I was then again put in a really position terrible position when the nursing home was down to one CNA for the whole 24 hours. 
And that felt like terrifying to me. So I left the nursing home to, to see if I could get better help elsewhere. And unfortunately, that was probably a mistake on one hand. But I've been in the hospital ever since. And the thing is, is that at home, I can do so much more than I can here. And the care here is wonderful medically, but I have no medical needs. I have personal care needs. And it's com it seems to be completely absurd to leave me in a hospital where I don't get anywhere near the amount of care I need. Yet the price tag is humongous. It, it just seems backwards and upside down and inside out. Because if I had a quarter of the expense that is being charged to my insurance, I could be fully staffed at a, probably a good wage. But these are the kind of consequences that we all have to think about. Should I be in a hospital that's charging a lot of money just to have me here and sit on my computer? and not really get the help I need. I only get like four or five hours of care, not even all day long, but I'm sitting here all day long. And it's not like they're not taking care of me. They are, but it's not right. And I should be at my own apartment and I should be taking care of my cat instead of having her be cared for by people that come in and out for five minutes. I mean, this is a great solution, but it's painful because I'm just here and I'm just getting weaker and weaker because I have no contact with people. And it's just, I'm just very frustrated. And I can't believe this happened because I was, I was one that could manage my care very well for a long time until this crisis of care workers and the crisis of people caring enough about other people. Because there's a lot of people out there that need jobs and need jobs like these for people going into any medical field. Like Amanda, she's going into PA. That's awesome. And personal care is the best experience you could have going into a medical field. And that's one of the things I've advocated for a long, long time. And I've had over probably 500 students help me over my lifetime here in Madison. And they are all very vibrant medical professionals now. And we are still all in touch. And that means I've made a complete impact on their healthcare providing. And they do have a different look at life because of it. And I'd love to answer any questions anybody would have. Thank you. Alder Vetter? Um, thank you. Um, Karen, I just, this will be quick. This is a quick question, but I wanted to find out, just to make for clarification, you now live in the hospital, correct? Yes, that, yes, that is correct. And are you sick? Is that why you're in the hospital? No, I am not sick. I'm actually getting more injured. I bro I bruised my hand really badly. That required x-rays. But that was a um, an accident, you know. But, you're but not, I have no medical needs here, none at all. But you're not sick. And so you're in the hospital, living in the hospital, not sick. And why are you there in the hospital, not at home? Because my caregiving agency decided to quit at the last minute right before Thanksgiving. And I have not been able to find any more help. Okay. And I mean, it's not a resourceful place to be. I ha can't really do a lot from my bed. And I'm not in a good accessible space for my own sake. Well, thank you, Karen. I just wanted to make that clarification so everybody would really understand your situation. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Alder. Thank you, thank you Karen. Alder Harrington McKinney. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I just wanted to make sure that Mr. Matheron had completed his statement. Thank you, Alder. Luciana, would you like to finish? Right. You want to finish your statement? Oh, thank you very much. 
So yeah, I was saying recommended care because lit people accept less care because little care might be better than not care at all. Madison can sh shine a light in this invisible crisis and by enacting some sensible recommendation will not only provide needed relief to the people silently, silently suffering in their home, but send a strong message to the other, more consequential branch of government, namely county, state, and Congress, that if it pass, it, that it is past time to act with their respective power. I'm very thankful and I applaud the perseverance and courage of my wife, Aldo woman, Barbara Vedder, to accept the challenge and in a very short time, thanks to the help of city staff and some of you, was able to bring that issue to the forefront of the city council. We need your help. Please pass this revolution, re resolution and let's get to work. Thank you for your work and for your time. Thank you. I have no other alders in the queue for questions. All right, so seeing none, we will go on. Give me a moment to refresh here. All right, our next item with registrants is item 127 approving a certified survey map of property owned by Tenney Place Development at 1601 to 1617 Sherman Avenue in the 12th Aldermanic District. We have Daniel Lushop of District 12 wishing to speak. I think I added uh, most of the uh, remarks uh, at item five. Uh, the only question I have right now, if this is the only necessary survey, if it was, uh, if a demographic survey was done, for instance, how many children will move in uh, these new units and is there adequate day daycare for them, uh, items like this. But other than that, I think everything was covered at item five. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions for the registrant? Seeing none. Uh, we'll go on to item 138, which is supporting bargaining between Office and Professional Employees International Union, Local 39, and CUNA Mutual Group. Our first registrant is Brian Barber of District 13, to be followed by Tuta Resad, to be followed by Michelle Curtis. We have Brian. Hey, thank you. I'm Brian Barber. I'm a steward in the union and a member of the bargaining team. And I would like to address the unfair labor practice charges against our employer with the National Labor Relations Board. The first charge we have filed is for failure to meet and confer. And in December, CUNY Mutual Group decided to end bargaining pay during the workday for our entire union bargaining team, which disrupted the established practice that existed between the parties for the first 10 months of bargaining. This forced our bargaining team to have to decide between bargaining during the workday without pay or working our regular work schedules. Um, CUNY Mutual Group then insisted that the parties bargain in person in another attempt to make a unilateral decision without the union's agreement. Some employees on our bargaining team need to be available to work until at least 5 p.m. and some live outside the Dane, Dane County area, which makes their insistence on bargaining in person extremely disruptive to our families' lives. Um, the second um, ULP charge was for retaliation and discrimination. Um, earlier this year, a technical glitch within the company system caused a delay in commission payments to represented field reps in our investor guidance center. The company stated that the payments would be delayed by three months. Our IGC field reps rely on these payments as part of their income to support their families. And the same glitch also affected non-represented field reps, and yet they were all paid on time. <clears throat> the company offered no explanation for why only represented field employees within the IGC were forced to wait an additional three months for their commission payments. After filing ULP charges for retaliation and discrimination, the company changed course and was able to resolve the issue for our represented field reps, and the commission payments were paid out only a week late. But the fact that it took filing a ULP charge for the company to address the delay for our represented field reps points to their disparate treatment of represented and non-represented staff. 
And the third charge is for bargaining in good faith. In addition to placing unnecessary restrictions on bargaining, the company has also refused to provide counter proposals and respond to information requests in a timely manner. And this goes back to uh, when we last uh, provided a counter proposal to CUNY Mutual Group on January 12th, 2023, and we did not receive a proposal back until Thursday, February 16th, which was more than a month later. And this is despite the NLRB standard of 10 business days for each party to reasonably provide a counter proposal. And the fourth uh, charge is for the joint employer rule, which uh, is related to CUNY Mutual Group's use of contractors as a way to sidestep having to negotiate with the union over their jobs. You have about 30 um, seconds left. Yeah, the company has a, over a thousand contractors, um, and yet they're only reporting about 40 to us. So in, for all intents and purposes, these contractors are employees and the company supervises their work and you know determines their schedules and um, they, they uh, should be within the bargaining unit based on that standard. So um, you know, these are examples of many of the reasons why they've uh, why we've reached out to leaders in our communities. Thank to you. Support a resolution. That's your time. Thank you. Our next registrant is Tuda Resad of DeForest, to be followed by Michelle Curtis, to be followed by Mike Farwell. Tuda? We almost had you. Try again to unmute yourself, please. Hello, uh, my name is Theuda Rasat. I'm a CUNA Mutual employee and a union member for the past 24 years. Tonight, I want to talk about CUNA Mutual values and practices in regards to di diversity, equity, and inclusion. First, I want to touch on the claim of inclusion on pay equity. While the company is conducting pay equity reviews twice a year for non-represented employees and adjusting wages, that right is being denied to the union employees. When the union requested to have those pay equity reviews done for the represented employees, the company's lawyer told our bargaining team that given the union access to the data would open the company to liability charges. For the non-represented staff, they conduct these reviews privately behind closed doors. If these pay equities reviews are, are conducted ethically, they shouldn't be done behind closed doors and should be conducted for all. Thus, CUNA Mutual should ha not, uh, have nothing to worry about. This only makes it clear that a pay equity review is needed to hold our company accountable. We applaud the company for adjusting wages for our non-represented co-workers, especially during the economic times that we're going through, but we, the union members, deserve the same treatment as our counterparts. In addition to the pay equity inclusion, I also want to raise awareness to the company's stance on the Rooney Rule that the union proposed for CUNA Mutual to adopt, and it was rejected by the company. For those unfamiliar with the Rooney Rule, it was introduced by the NFL, and it is a diversity policy that mandates teams interview at least two ethnic minority candidates for each external job posted in hopes to increase diversity within an organization. And even though this rule does not require the company to hire any of those candidates, it was again, re again rejected. Last but not least, the union also proposed to make additional efforts to do recruitment outreach to, at historically black colleges and universities as a measure of diversifying our workplace. And as you may guess, that proposal was also rejected. We're happy that CUNA donates large amounts of money to local nonprofits and the community we live in. All we're asking is that the company's external DEI values are also applied internally to the employees who make CUNA Mutual successful day in and day out. Thank you. Thank you. Our next registrant is Michelle Curtis of Stoughton to be followed by Mike Farwell, to be followed by David Howell. Hello, my name is Michelle Curtis and I'm an employee at Kenya Mutual Group and a member of OPEIU Local 39. One of the benefits we're trying to negotiate is affordable and sufficient health insurance for our members and their families. Currently, the majority of our members opt into the HMO plan. 
This gives those members the security of knowing they will never have a big out-of-pocket expense all at once. Our employer tries to remove that plan every time we bargain, but conceded to keep it before negotiations broke down. However, not all members are in the coverage area of that plan. The number of people in our company that our company hires remotely continues to increase every year. And soon, most members will not have access to this quality HMO plan. That is why our remaining healthcare proposals addressing the high deductible plans are so important. The other options have substantial, substantial deductibles, $1,500 to $2,000 for employee-only coverage, for instance, before the insurance begins covering expenses. For those who are living paycheck to paycheck, that can be a prohibitively high amount of money that may lead members to avoiding seeking medical care when needed. Before my partner passed away, I was supporting both of us. He had a heart attack a few years before, and instead of calling an ambulance, he called me at work. I told him to call the ambulance, and he said, we can't afford it. Because I had the HMO, I was able to tell him it was covered and he got treatment before the issue became fatal. If I hadn't had the HMO, he wouldn't have called the ambulance and I would, and would have died three years sooner than he did. Members that can't choose the HMO may very well come to that sort of crisis. All of our members need to have access to insurance without prohibitively high deductibles and that provide a reasonable level of coverage for care. When a company is as profitable year over year as CUNA Mutual Group is, no employee or their family should ever be forced to decide whether or not to seek potentially life-saving medical care. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next tradition is Mike Farwell of Dodgeville to be followed by David Howell to be followed by Joe Avica. We have Mike. Yes, I'm here. Go ahead. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Mike Farwell. Um, I'm a union steward at CUNY Mutual Group, and I'm a member of the bargaining team. Um, I started at CUNY Mutual Group in 2014 as a contract to hire, and company then brought me on uh, approximately a year later. So I wanted to speak to you about CUNY's use of contractors. During the past 20 years, uh, Union employees have fallen from around 1,700 to around 450 at CUNY Mutual. Uh, contractors are currently estimated at many hundreds uh, being employed by CUNY Mutual and is likely well over 1,000. I say estimated because the list of contractors that are being used is required to be provided to the union on a regular basis. The current list that the company provides to us has about 40 names on it. I've personally seen far more than 40 individuals in single meetings, often more than 100 at a time. Um, these contractors are employed both in the Madison area throughout the United States, but also in India and other foreign countries. Um, the union stance is that there definitely is a time and a place to use contractors and that they can be very beneficial for the company. However, um, these contractors are supposed to be used for temporary project work to temporarily provide expertise on a team when it's missing or to temporarily fill a vacancy when it's open, such as for leaves of absence or FMLA, FMLA leaves, things like that. The key here is that they are supposed to be temporary. Our current contract allows them to be employed for up to 12 months at CUNY Mutual, but many of these contractors have been there for years, some well over a decade. Um, these are contractors that we work with side by side on a regular basis, and uh, it's not uncommon for us to be working with them for more than a year at a time, uh, doing the exact same jobs as they're doing and uh, reporting to the same managers having the same responsibilities, so on and so forth. Now, with us working with these contractors for so long, um, we don't have any uh, problems with the contractors themselves. They're often our friends and colleagues due to our close working relationship with them. We don't have any ill will towards them. But 
the problem is is that uh many of them express a desire to work for cuna mutual group but for one reason or another you have about denied. 20 seconds left um, often they mention that they have a uh, lack of benefits or when they're available, they're uh, very costly. Their salaries are often far below what we uh, get as full employees. And, and they want to have a good paying job. Thank, Thank you. you. Our next tradition is David Howell of District 19 to be followed by Joe Avika. David? My name is David Howell, and I have worked for Kena Mutual Group for four years as a software developer, and I'm also a member of the union's contract action team. At the start of negotiations, our employer expressed to us that they did not expect the, these negotiations to be concessionary for the union. Despite this, the company is proposing to eliminate the pension plan for all new hires. This is in spite of Kena Mutual Group posting over $1 billion in net profit over the course of the last three years. In past contract negotiations, the company has asked the union to make concessions during bargaining to support their financial health during economic hardship. However, now that our employer is thriving, they are still trying to cut back our benefit plan. Even if Kino Mutual was struggling financially, cutting the pension plan would do very little to help them. According to their own projections, it would save them only $189,000 over the course of the next three years. This is a drop in the bucket compared to their $1 billion in net profit from the previous three years. Part of the company's business portfolio is an entire division dedicated to providing these pension plans for thousands of credit union employees and other businesses across the country. We love that Kena Mutual Group helps provide these benefits to our customers. We just want our employer to continue doing the same for its own employees. While $189,000 is a small number for the company, it is significant for our future members and it is unreasonable to make cuts to their retirement. Pension plans have become more rare as employers continue to target the retirement benefits of their employees over the last 40 and counting years. Nevertheless, we have also proposed to replace the pension plan with equivalent compensation, such as increasing our new hires 401k employer contributions and or increasing employer contributions to the HSA. Regardless, the company has rejected our proposals. The company's current proposal will result in future members having employer contributions cut to their retirement plan or cut to their retirement plan in half. It's hard not to think about how many additional years our new members will have to work to make up for those lost funds. Proposing cuts to our retirement benefits at a time when CUNA Mutual Group is doing so well is hurtful to our members who have worked so hard to put the company in its current position. Our employer often discusses providing its customers with financial strength and stability. It would be welcome to see that same attitude extended towards the financial strength and stability of their own employees. Retaining our pension plan for all members would put us one step closer to making that a reality. I'd like to thank the entire council for their time. This issue is incredibly important to all of us, both that we're able to speak tonight and over Zoom. So thank you very much. Thank you. Our last registrant on this item is Joe Avika of District 11. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, so my name is Joe Ivica. I've been an employee at CUNA Mutual for a little more than four years now, and I'm the chief steward of our union. Uh, my coworkers and I have been fighting for a fair contract for more than a year now, and we've gone about two years without a pay increase. What we're asking for is wages that keep up with inflation, to keep our pension plan, to maintain quality health care for our members, to stop the rampant outsourcing and contracting of our work, and for the equal implementation of pay equity adjustments for our union. Despite record profits the last few years, my coworkers have been met with resistance every step of the way. The company has been offering ceaseless updates via work email to try to divide members. They've hired anti-union law firms to represent them at the bargaining table. They've illegally stalled the bargaining process, causing us to have to file multiple unfair labor practice charges. And most recently, last Tuesday, uh, actually the day after my, myself and our coworkers met with Mayor Rhodes Conway, uh, I was called into a meeting uh, at the very beginning of my shift 
and I was told that I was being put under investigation for potential disciplinary action, including an up to termination. They told me that they hired the second largest anti-union law firm in the country to conduct their investigation and that they were forcing me to immediately hand over my work laptop. Now I wanna show you this. Some of you may recognize the, the person in this picture um, that I have with me. Um, many of you recognize her from the movie. In the movie, her name was Norma Ray. Her real name is Crystal Lee Sutton. And the movie is about her struggle to help organize a multiracial union of textile workers in the South. She was fired by her company for helping lead an organizing drive. And when she legally fought to be reinstated, her company hired a law firm called Ogletree Deacons to fight her reinstatement. And that's the same company, the same law firm that CUNA Mutual Group has hired for their investigation. Um, all of this happened within a week of my coworkers and I holding an emergency meeting to discuss the potential of going out on an unfair labor practice strike. And as their union representative, my coworkers often reach out to me in confidence um, with sensitive questions about their employment status. About 30 and, seconds left. Yep, with the company taking my laptop, they now have access to many of these private conversations. Um, and I'm just here to say that my coworkers and I will not be intimidated by CUNA Mutual Group. We'll continue to fight as much as we can. We'll give all of our energy to this effort. Um, on Thursday, the Dane County Board passed a similar resolution 24 to one. 11 state representatives and senators just signed on to a joint letter supporting us. And I just urge you all today uh, to and vote in time. favor of item 138. Thanks. Thank you. So our last registrant wishing to speak on item 138. Are there questions for any of our registrants? Seeing none, that brings us to the end of public comment. Alder Vitiver, I knew I could count on you. 10 minute break, please. So moved and seconded to take a 10 minute break. It is, uh, let's call it 9, a, 9 p.m. <laughs> So we'll call it 9.10 that we come back. Is there any objection? Alder Paulson? No, no objection. I'll, we'll be back in 10 minutes.
Oh, thank you, Alder Helia. Here. Helia is present. Alder Benford. Present. Benford is present. Alder Bennett. Right back. Alder Carter. Present. Alder Carter is present. Alder Conklin. Present. Alder Conklin is present. Alder Curry. Here. Alder Curry is present. Alder Evers. Here. Alder Evers is present. Alder Figueroa Cole. Get right back. Alder Foster. Here. Alder Foster is present. Alder Furman. Alder Furman is present. Alder Harrington McKinney. Present. Alder Harrington McKinney is present. Alder Heck. Sorry. You're back. Alder Madison. Here. Alder Madison is present. Alder Miyazzi. Here. Alder Miyazzi is present. Alder Paulson. Present. Alder Paulson is present. Alder Fair. Here. Alder Fair is present. Alder Tischler. Alder Tischler is present. Alder Vetter. Here. Alder Vetter is present. Alder Revere. Here. Alder Revere is present. Alder Vitiver. Here. Alder Vitiver is present. Alder Bennett. Soon, Alder Figueroa Cole. Yeah. Alder Figueroa Cole is present. Alder Heck. Uh, we're showing 18 present. All right, a quorum being present. Uh, we will go on. And the first item is item number four, Legistar 75678, an alternate amending subsections of the supplemental regulations regarding mm -hmm. the keeping of chickens. On item number four, President Furman. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, adopt with conditions, and I'd like a point of uh, order um, once the uh, once I get a second. There a second? Go ahead. Um, just a clarification. Um, the agenda uh, and everywhere does refer to this as an alternate. It should be a substitute. It does have the support of the lead sponsor. Thank you. Thank you, President Furman. So the motion is to adopt the substitute with conditions. Are there questions for staff? Alder Harrington McKinney, is it a question? Yes, I do. Um, it said that um, this was referred on to the Madison Food Policy Council, and they did not meet on 3-1-23. And I, I guess my question is, is that why did not, um, why was it not re-referred to the Madison Food Policy Council? Uh, is there staff that can speak to this? I do not have information about why they did not meet. Okay. Um, so, Alder, I don't believe staff have information on why the Food Policy Council did not meet, um, but it is generally uh, possible for referral bodies to be skipped. Um, if there is a date certain that it comes back to the council, there are alders who may be able to answer your question when we get into debate. Thank you, Alder. Are there other questions for staff? Alder Carter? Yes. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, one of the, during public comments, someone mentioned uh, that it probably should be 10 chickens since um, when establishment sells um, the baby chicks is usually sold in five. I'm wondering why this um, is not included as 10 chickens instead of eight. Katie? <laughs> So the um, original proposal was for 10 chickens. Uh, staff recommended six. We didn't have a ton of time to look at it, but we thought uh, six would certainly be reasonable. We had no concerns with that. Plan mm -hmm. Commission um, recommended eight as a compromise, and staff is supportive of that compromise. Um, yeah, thank you for that. I still think that raises the problem if establishments are selling them and Alder, is there a question? Yes, I'd like to see it change to 10. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Uh, I have no further Alders in the queue with questions. It's been moved and seconded to adopt uh, the substitute with conditions. Is there discussion? Alder Carter? 
Yes, given the testimony from the public regarding the sale of baby chicks and the quantity that they sell them, I think that it should be um, <clears throat> should be revised to ten. It still creates eight. Still creates the problem of what to do with the extra chicks that you have and giving them away, et cetera, et cetera. I would like to see that if my colleagues agree. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. I have no other Alders in the queue wishing to speak. The motion before us is to adopt the substitute with conditions. Is there objection to recording unanimous vote in favor? Seeing no objection, record a unanimous vote. Oh, Alder Wahele. Alder Wahele. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I think uh, the question that uh, Alder Carter has raised, I don't know if that can be answered. I don't know. Uh, she made, I don't know if she meant to make a second substitute or I don't know. Uh, but she made a comment and that was not um, taken uh, into consideration. Alder, I'm not sure what process you think should have happened, but you are all free to comment. You're all free to make motions if you'd like. There was no motion made, and I move to a vote. There's no objection to the vote. So the item is adopted. Seeing no objection, the item is adopted. And we'll move on to item five. Oh, Alder Wahilie, did you have a further question, Alder? No, Alder Carter? No, um, no, that's okay. I just think it puts the, the public, I don't have chickens, so I'm not an expert on this. I just think that it puts the so, public all, all there, we're no longer, at a disadvantage. That's all. We're no longer that was in discussion my point. on this item. No, that was my point is what I'm saying. Thank you, Alder. Our next item is item five which is Legistar 76309, creating sections of the Madison General Ordinances to change the zoning of a property at 1601 to 1617 Sherman Avenue. Given that item 127 is on the same property, is there any objection to taking items 5 and 127 together? President Furman? Move adoption. So uh, both items five and 127 are moved and seconded. Are there questions for staff on either five or 127? Seeing no questions for staff. Um, is there discussion on items five and 127? Seeing no discussion, is there any objection to recording unanimous votes in favor of items five and item 127? Seeing no objection, we'll record unanimous votes in favor of both items five and item 127. That will take us to Item 12, which is Legistar 76448, amending sections of the Madison General Ordinances to eliminate the Golf Subcommittee and the Warner Park Community Recreation Center Advisory Subcommittees of the Board of Parks Commissioners. President Furman. Move adoption. Second. Moved and seconded to adopt. Alder Benford, I believe you had questions. Thank you, Mayor. I'm not sure if Parks Director Knapp is present or or staff from Parks. Yes, we have uh, the Parks Director here. Great. Uh, Director Knapp, I had a question about the Warner Park 
uh, Recreation and Community Center Advisory Board. Uh, my question relates to back in 2003 when I was first elected. I served on that advisory board. And um, I'm removed from the institutional history, but what what happened? <laughs> it was such an integral part of the development and making the center more inclusive. Can you just give me a little background over the years? Well, I don't. I'm not going to go all the way back to 2003. Um, I wasn't with the the city at that point. Um, but I can certainly go back through my tenure in parks from 09 and, and the advisory board has certainly served a significant purpose in helping set up the center for its, I think, very successful community-based program that it, that we operate there in partnership with MSCR and New Bridge and others. Um, over the last decade, we've, uh, we've made some attempts to add some youth voice to the, the group uh, struggled in that way. We've had representatives of a multitude of agencies. Uh, we've struggled to meet quorum a lot. And I think Alder, frankly, I think it's an example of a committee that's outlived its purpose. Its purpose was to give us all a community center that was multi-generational, multifaceted, equitable, inclusive, right? And providing a lot of different diverse programs in a very busy center. And I think that's what we have. And our staff have developed those uh, relationships with Vera Court. We I heard earlier we we're talking about uh, Vera Court, right? But Northport, Packers, Brentwood, we've done I think a lot of that work at a staff and interrelationship level where the committee isn't necessarily needed as much. M that committee had representatives from MSCR, Newbridge, and others. Those folks are still working with us side by side every day. They're all at the table in our stakeholder process for expansion of the center. We are not um, at all saying we're going to go this alone. We just think we've developed those relationships in a way that a committee, a formal committee that frankly has struggled to meet for the last five years, especially with quorum issues, um, isn't necessarily needed anymore. For the group, the facilities, programs, and fees subcommittee of the Park Commission was reestablished about four years ago. And that group has oversight of fees, policies around fees and access, right? Programming. And um, we think that board can, that subcommittee of the Park Commission can serve the legal purposes the committee still had. Uh, but I hope that's generally helpful, but it, it's certainly not, uh, there's a recognition of a committee that served its purpose for a very long time and helped us get to where we are. Uh, but I just, I tend to think if you don't, if you're having quorum issues with partners who you do see all the time, these folks we see all the time, if we're not making meetings happen, then there's not probably business to do. I understand. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Alder. Alder Mianze, questions for staff? I'm just wondering, um, Eric, uh, what do you propose as a, as a way to, in order to do outreach with the public as far as uh, community engagement? If we get rid of this uh, committee, well, I all there to, to be frank, I, I don't think this committee has served that purpose over the last decade as a primary integration with community input. We have a dedicated staff. Uh, Zach Watson's a facility pro facility program manager. Terrence was formerly that. Now our community services manager. We have deep connections on the north side, and I expect. I certainly have set the expectation of staff and they have set it up themselves to maintain those connections um, through, I would say, a, a less formal structure. Uh, I, I strongly believe that our community engagement um, around the center is, is at an all-time high and will be sustained. And have, we have not relied on this committee to, do, to, to, to be that primary vehicle. That said, anyone who wants to use the formal committee process to talk about the Center still has the Board of Park Commissioners that meets every month, the Long Range Planning Subcommittee, uh, and the Facilities and Programs and Fees Subcommittee also meet regularly and can certainly um, certainly be a, a conduit for those type of engagements. Oh, thank you. I, I agree with you. Um, I've been working with uh, both Terrence and uh, 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 Watson, so I, I do appreciate all the work that they do and that you do yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Thank I have no other Alders. 
in the queue for questions. So on item 12, it's been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? Seeing no discussion, is there any objection to recording a unanimous vote in favor of item 12? Seeing no objection, we'll record a unanimous vote in favor of item 12. And go on to item 15, which is Legistar 76226, uh, authorizing a one-year competitively selected service contract with CJC for as asphalt pavement and concrete testing, soil compaction testing, and geotechnical services on various projects throughout the city. On item 15, President Furman, a motion? Move adoption. Moved and seconded to adopt item 15. On item 15, Alder Harrington McKinney, did you have questions? I have a question for staff. Go ahead. Um, in um, reviewing that, it said um, um, an annual renewal of $600,000, but there is a caveat that opens it up to a, f a maximum of five years. So could the staff just give a brief update on this project? Yep. Chris Petakowski is here. Yeah. So, thanks. Uh, so this uh, this particular item is our annual um, soil testing contract that uh, we use uh, for a lot of our, our borings and for our city uh, reconstructs, testing the soils, the pavements, the, um, uh, uh, the stone uh, base, and 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 those types of items. So the uh, the uh, particular contract that we've done uh, in the past uh, would be to kind of set up a, uh, a year and then give the option if it's working for the city um, to uh, uh, extend up to an, a, 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 a few more years after that. So that's, that's kind of the typical process that this contract has gone through. Is it um, um, is this company the only one that provides that? Because uh, there was not a non compete. So there were three companies that uh, proposed in the uh, get, sent us a proposal. Uh, we had a team uh, uh, that worked with purchasing to score the score the proposals based on uh, company capability, the project team, the approach. Uh, their experience and then also their costs. So um, the 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 panel scored the uh, the three proposals and uh, are proposing to select CGC for this contract. It does give us the option of going back and um, reviewing this. The contract is not specifically for. This company is that correct? Does the city have an opportunity to go back and and change that over a five year period? No, th this contract is would be entered with the city and CGC, and the and it would provide an opportunity for us to extend it another year if uh, or or uh, a year at a time uh, if we would like to. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alder. I have no other alders in the queue for questions, so it's been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? Seeing no discussion, is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor? Seeing no objection, recording unanimous vote in favor of item 15. And we'll move on to item 29. Item 29 is Legistar 76510. Approving plans and specifications for public improvements uh, necessary for the project at 5604 Schroeder Road. Uh, President Furman, a motion. Move adoption. Second. Moved and seconded to adopt item 29. Alder Harrington McKinney, you had questions for staff? One question. And um, uh, is it projected or where do I find the, 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 the time that this is this will be over. It's likely another question for Chris. Yeah, so this is a uh, uh, an apartment building that was approved at uh, the plan commission and, and this particular item 
requires them to re reconstruct the sidewalk and the gutter and driveway in front of their in front of their new building. So I would expect uh, these type of buildings typically take about a year to a year and a half, and then uh, uh, the restoration is usually at the end of that. So it'd be about that time frame. And so my final, my follow-up question is, is that during this process, if it's projected to be a year, is that some kind of notification that uh, um, residents will receive? Well, they would have been uh, notified for the public hearing when the project was approved. Um, so this is really just the restoration of the sidewalk after the building is, is complete. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Carter, questions for staff? Yeah, Chris, is this just the sidewalk and not the, um, I believe, the entranceway? Because there is currently yeah. apartments next door. Yeah, so this, I, I, I shouldn't have said just sidewalk. It, it is the sidewalk. It's their driveway, uh, okay. their stormwater uh, lateral, their sanitary lateral and uh, water lateral as well so um that's what i wanted to know thank you you're welcome thank you alder i have no other alders in the queue with questions it's been moved and seconded is there discussion alder carter you don't have to okay thank you Seeing no discussion, is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor of item 29? Seeing no objection, we'll record a unanimous vote in favor of item 29 and go on to item 31, which is Legistar 76512, authorizing an amendment to the existing purchase of service contract between the City of Madison and Destry Design Architects to provide architectural and engineering design services for the Tenney Park Beach Shelter Project at 1330 Sherman Avenue. President Furman, a motion. Move adoption. Moved and seconded to adopt. Uh, Alder Harrington McKinney, I believe this was you as well? Uh, yes, it was. Um, in reading the, uh, the documents, um, there was not a price estimate for this architectural service. Uh, this is likely Mr. Knapp or Brian Cooper. Go ahead, Brian. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Yes, uh, the price should be in the resolution. So the total uh, not to exceed price at this point is $90,000. Other? I thought I read that there was a potential of an, an addition, additional amount, or did I misread that? Um, at this point, Alder, the maximum price is ninety thousand dollars. This is a this is an amendment to uh, a previously approved contract. Okay, I must have misread it then. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. No other alders in the queue for questions. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing no discussion, is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor of item 31? Seeing no objection, we record a unanimous vote in favor of item 31. And we will go on to item 45. Item 45 is Legistar 76652, declaring the City of Madison's intention to exercise police powers to establish the Lake Mendota Drive Assessment District. President, for a motion. Move adoption. Moved and seconded to adopt. Alder Harrington McKinney, questions? Uh, Madam Mayor, I did get the answer to that on my break, so I'm withdrawing. Thank you, Alder. Are there any other questions? Seeing no other questions, it's been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? Seeing no discussion, is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor? Seeing no objection, we record a unanimous vote in favor of item 45. That will take us to item 101. Item 101 is Legislature 76500. A substitute 
excuse me, a second substitute amending sections of the Madison General Ordinances um, with respect to Legistar and Council procedure. President Furman. Move adoption of second substitute. Moved and seconded to adopt the second substitute. Are there questions on item 101? Although Healy. Thank you, Madam Mayor. If Attorney Haas could walk through the changes of this uh, uh, ordinance. Attorney Haas. Sure, thank you, <clears throat> Alder. Um, I think I'll just uh, walk through the memo that I provided to the council uh, last night, I think it was. Um, I think that's probably the clearest way to, to um, review the second substitute. Um, we divided it, the second substitute up into five sections. First section would simply require that any amendment to an ordinance that is made on the council floor needs to be approved by the city attorney prior to the vote. Um, I would anticipate that that would not make much of a difference. It would just ensure that we are, that the city attorney is provided with the uh, written ordinance amendment. So we can check for things like, you know, grammar, make sure it's in the right subsection, um, make sure that there's no significant legal issues with it. So we can uh, advise the council before there's a vote. Um, second part of it, uh, just uh, <clears throat> um, clarifies that the, the mayor or the presiding officer can recognize either the council president or another alder to make the motions. The practice, of course, has been that the president typically makes the motions uh, on the council floor, although that is not um, described or established by ordinance. It would also allow the whoever is recognized to make the motion to defer to another alder uh, if they wish to make the motion. Um, it would also, um, this is maybe a more significant proposed change, it would allow ordinance, uh, it would allow motions to be made at any time after the initial motion um, is on the floor. So that includes prior to or during uh, staff presentations or questions to staff so that the uh, uh, council could conceivably determine whether it was necessary to have um, staff questions or further presentation or if they wanted to proceed to a vote on an alternate motion. Um, third, uh, we have language that uh, clarifies, I think probably is largely consistent with current practice, but it, it clarifies the council president's uh, role in approving a consent agenda. <clears throat> um, it, uh, it allows the president to indicate an alternate motion on the consent agenda that is different from an action recommended by the lead referral committee. But if the president wishes to, to do that, uh, they need to have the consent of the lead sponsor uh, as well. So um, if, there is an, if there is an alternate that comes out of the lead referral committee, and that alternate has a sponsor currently and under, under this proposal, that alternate would be the recommended motion. If the president wanted to uh, change that recommended motion, the president would need the consent of the lead sponsor. If the lead sponsor did not uh, consent, the president's option really is to, to uh, ask for it to be excluded or to exclude it from the consent agenda. Um, also, there's kind of catch-all language. If any alder requests referral of an item or an action that is different than what the recommended action is on the agenda, that item is excluded from the consent agenda, which I think is just uh, what the current practice is. Um, we repealed some language that we uh, thought was not uh, necessary given, uh, given other changes in the sub substitute. Uh, so the fourth category is um, uh, just kind of defines the 
current um, role of a lead referral committee, um, I think it is consistent with the current practice about the um, recommendation of a lead referral becoming the recommended motion. Again, there's language, similar language, allowing the council president to add an agenda note on the council agenda, and also similar language indicating that if that is different, if that um, recommends a different action than the lead referral committee recommended, the president needs to have the consent of the sponsor, of the lead sponsor. Um, also additional language that all recommendations of all BCCs are be, to be reported to the council through Legistar. Um, and then uh, we have language in this section and, and the following section um, just to try to clarify, I guess, what we might call uh, version control, indicating that um, uh, any changes to a report or a document that is going to be adopted in an ordinance or resolution needs to be um, labeled or marked as version two, version three, um, so that alders in the public can see if those underlying documents have been altered since they have been introduced. Um, it would also require then the, the ordinance or the resolution to, uh, to be updated as well and referred to that, that uh, new version so that we, could not, we would not have a resolution or ordinance that is changed by virtue of the underlying document changing without the legislation also changing. Um, finally, the fifth category, um, again, just sort of um, requires that after um, legislation is published on an agenda, all versions, all new versions, um, need to, uh, that are updated, let me uh, go back. All um, prior versions need to be retained in Legistar. If there are uh, new versions inserted, the prior versions are to be retained, again, so that the public and the council can see um, how versions have changed over time. Um, so I think that covers it, but I'd be happy to answer any other questions. Aldo Healy, did you have further questions? Yes, Madam Mayor. Uh, so the the old version um, and the substitute, uh, there is a change between the alternate and the substitute rather than using the um, uh, version one, two, and three. Can you elaborate more on that? And you know what will be the change? Uh, uh, if I understand your question, Alder, the, the previous ver version of this ordinance, and I think the the first substitute that came out of CCEC, proposed eliminating the term substitutes and alternates, and uh, going to a system where that, where any change would just be referred to as as a new version. Um, that provision was removed. Okay. Um, with the second substitute, so there is no longer um, a proposal to eliminate the terms substitute and alternate. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Harrington McKinney, questions? I'll wait for discussion. Thank you, Alder. Uh, Alder Carter, questions? No, my question was just answered by uh, Attorney Haas. Thank you, Alder. Alder Paulson, questions? Yes, for Attorney Haas, uh, just to follow up on uh, item one, we talked about this mm -hmm. email. If you could just clarify on what that does for uh, making changes on the floor and if that discourages that or, or has any changes and how the timing works on, on that. Sure, I, I would expect in most cases it's not gonna, going to have any effect. Um, I will say sometimes when alders circulate their ordinance amendments on the floor to other alders and to the clerk and the mayor. I don't get them. And so sometimes, although they're red, we're not seeing them on paper. 
And this merely gives us an opportunity or the city attorney the opportunity to again make sure that you know the grammar is correct, the punctuation is correct, that it's not supposed to be in a different section of the ordinance. The language is that the city attorney is approving it to, as to form. And so um, I think that that is all that this would uh, give us the opportunity to do. I think practically speaking, what that would mean is as the council is discussing the proposal, we'll have a chance to read it. If we see any issues with it, we can alert the mayor and then that can be discussed by the council, but certainly the council still has the opportunity to continue to make amendments at that time. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. I have no other Alders in the queue with questions. So uh, item 101 has been moved and seconded to adopt the second substitute. Is there discussion? Alder Harrington McKinney. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. In reviewing this, um, I first went through to look at the um, duties and responsibilities of the president and vice president. And I went through that first, and I'm not going to, um, to go through that because you know, we all have access to that. Um, but what I found very interesting is um, what is good policy? And a good policy is one that solves problems without creating a political rift whenever it is believed that it can solve a problem without one party disagreeing with its inception. It can go forward without issue. What are the future features of a good policy? Stable and future proofed developed considering the impact of policy on different groups known and understood by all that are affected by the policy, written in clear, concise language. Stakeholders have been involved in the development, known and understood by all that are affected by the policy. Ideas have been tested before implementation, there is an effective due date. And finally, um, as I review the, the iterations of this ordinance, um, I'm looking for what was the problem, the goals to be achieved, and um, I'd like to offer a substitute, if that's in order, at this time. It is. Okay, my substitute is that um, this be placed on file without prejudice. The motion is to place on file without prejudice. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, the motion before us is now to place on file without prejudice. Is there further discussion? Alder Foster. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Yes, I do not support this motion. Um, I think these are uh, good, uh, relatively simple changes. Um, and so I will be voting against uh, this motion. Thanks. Thank you, Alder. Is there further discussion? Alder Harrington McKinney? Uh, thank you. This is my second time speaking. Um, I, I guess my question is, is that uh, this is the last council meeting before a new council will be seated in um, in April. And I'm just wondering why this has to go through at this point. And so that's why I offered it. There's some you know good qualities within this, but this is just presented. And um, I have a ch my problem with this is is that there are five different steps that the um, that the attorney listed and we've not had an opportunity and I read it and reread it and I reread it. And at this point, I don't see the sense of urgency for this to go forward um, at this council meeting. And that's why I voted to place it on file. Thank you, Alder. Alder Wahilahi. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I agree with Alder Harrington McKinney uh, to put this on file. And the reason being is we have uh, eight alders who will be completely new 
Uh, we have seven alders who will be coming back for sure. And we have five alders who might come back or who might not come back. Uh, I have been privileged that I don't have a campaign to run as an, I am unopposed, but some of my colleagues are running a very competitive uh, campaign. And to go through this ordinance in this late uh, 11th hour, I think it's not fair to our colleagues. It will be good to have some kind of consistency in terms of changing the ordinance in a, in a way that's more relevant to our new uh, alders who will be coming in uh, on board on April 18th. So I, I think we can always bring back. Uh, unfortunately, you know, this is the sponsors who are making this will not be relevant to them as they will not be uh, sitting on the chamber with us. Uh, so I think, I hope uh, my colleagues will, will support this so that we can have uh, more collaboration with our new alders who will be coming uh, to be serving with us. And we can always bring back, I, you know, the, there's a good substance in the ordinance from the original version to the substitute. There's good improvement that I can see. But I guess, you know, as uh, all the, uh, uh, attorney has alluded to, you know, discussing for almost like five minutes, there are many different segments of it. And it needs a very uh, attentive uh, time to uh, consume and understand and reflect and execute. So I think it will be better not to rush this and take our time with our new elders uh, to have this uh, um, ordinance uh, in the future. It, it can always come back. And my hope is, you know, when we have the council all uh, situated that we can uh, uh, bring back. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Berman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I want to thank Attorney Haas and uh, Alder Foster um, for working with uh, me on, on the, these changes. Um, obviously, everybody has seen that this has evolved um, as we receive feedback. Um, I, am, I am frustrated that the people giving feedback this evening um, didn't, didn't reach out, didn't want to talk about any of this, and are just bringing objections to whether or not we should even do this here, um, not objections to the content of it. I think the, the struggle I've had as council president is that a lot of our processes aren't documented. They're handed down from word of mouth or memos somewhere and trying to figure out how things should work or how things work is not entirely clear. And so the purpose of this was to make it clear, put it in ordinance, um, codify things that more or less are current process or, 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 or slight improvements to current process. So for example, avoiding us passing an ordinance change on the floor of the council uh, that, that, that doesn't actually meet the legal requirements of an ordinance change. Um, that, seems, that seems pretty straightforward. Um, we, we shouldn't be passing ordinances that haven't been reviewed form. Um, making motions, it's com codifying stuff that we're already doing and trying to cut out a little bit of time of giving somebody the ability to, to, to make an alternative motion and not have to wait for, for questions on something that the, the initial motion may not even happen. On the creation of the consent agenda, um, this is current practice. The council president is doing it. Um, if you ask people in this room, and I'm not looking to quiz people, I'm not sure everybody knows who approves it currently. It's sort of up to staff at this point to decide who gets to approve it. Um, and you know, I, we, the staff has deferred to the council president to approve the consent agenda. Uh, the improvement of getting, um, which is something I have done uh, almost every time, um, when there's an alternative motion, get um, lead sponsor approval. Um, just makes sense. Um, it gives a, a path for um, coming to some sort of consensus and the consensus is not happening um, to actually then just exclude it. And I want to be clear when it comes to motions, it doesn't ultimately matter what the main motion is or the uh, initial motion is. Um, it, what matters is what the council ends up doing. So, um, you know, this doesn't take the power away from, from any, any alder or the majority of alders um, frankly, to make other motions or, or pass another motion. Um, it's just meant to be a little bit more orderly and, and more clear. And then the versioning control, I could tell you guys some stories about stuff that I have seen in the last year that just blows my mind about how staff, not maliciously, um, but they change things after an agenda is published. We had a, an item that all alders got an email about, but the, the attachment was changed Tuesday morning of the council meeting with frankly substantial changes to the attachment 
And luckily, the alder that had asked for those changes brought something up to me about that, and we were able to alert everybody that the attachment was changed. But otherwise, unless you're reviewing the, you know, every agenda item and all the attachments before the meeting, um, you're going to have no idea that an attachment changed, or frankly, whatever attachment we're passing. Um, we had a map ordinance recently where you know, staff added a second, second amendment or something, and it wasn't clear where, when, when that happened or what we were voting on. Versioning control just makes sense. So th these, I think, are important changes. Um, I don't think they're, uh, you know, I appreciate the work Attorney Haas has made trying to explain these. Happy to answer more questions tonight. But one of my fears is if we don't implement something like this, um, future alders, new alders, will not know what the process is. They won't know where to look unless they find the particular memo somewhere or they go through the orientation slides and go to the right PowerPoint page. The fact that you can go into the ordinance, you can look up, see how things work, just provides a ton more transparency and provides the ability to change it much easier in the future as a council decision if people decide ultimately that they want any of this process to be different. So um, I, I, I've appreciated the feedback that we've gotten over the last, especially over the last few days, and that's why there are a lot of tweaks to this. Um, and, 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 and by a lot of tweaks, I mean we've made it simpler. Um, we've taken out some things that um, seemed like they would have been a lot more complicated um, to implement. Um, but these are, these are common sense changes. If people have concerns as to form, I'm happy to entertain um, amendments this evening to it. Um, but I really do think this is going to make, um, especially for new alders, a, a, a world of difference for them to better understand the process and have it be much more transparent other than you know, word of mouth and passing things down from generation to generation. Thanks. Thank you, Alder, Alder Paulson. Yeah, I think that uh, tonight is actually very much the night to take this up. Um, uh, and not to not to delay this uh, into the next council. Um, this is uh, capturing a lot of the work that we already do and clarifying a lot of things. Um, and and it's and I think it's really helpful to have this uh, written down and, and created. I'll say that um, amazingly, I'm not the most uh, junior alder anymore, even though I've only been here a year. Um, and uh, even just reviewing this from finding things in the ordinance, I finally answered a couple of questions like, oh, that's why we do it that way and, and, uh, and how that gets set up and finding in the ordinance uh, uh, was helpful. So all these things, all these five points, these are all things that we're already doing and I think it's super important that we actually do write them down uh, and there are some improvements uh, to, to some of the process. Um, just, just the little tweaks that um, you know, we have gotten ourselves tripped up over that writing it down, uh, clarifying, get everyone on the same page for how it's supposed to work so we're not scrambling. Um, um, but I think that now is the, now is the time to do this uh, because we are as experienced as we're going to get um, uh, for a little while. And this is the sort of stuff that you dig into after you've been here for a while uh, and you understand why the hell we need uh, this particular clause, uh, you know, the, the the Garfield meme. Hey, I wonder why you know the, the Garfield where there's a no Garfield thing, and it's a. Uh, I wonder who this sign is for. Um, you know, this is a. Um, there are there are reasons that all these things are here for that. It helps to uh, have experience to know why we why we put them in. So this is this is when we should do this, uh, and so we should not delay this, um, and we should uh, take this up tonight and pass it. And there is a lot of really great stuff. Uh, in this, so I hope we vote down this uh, referral and we move on to taking the main motion. Thank you. Thank you, Alder Conklin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> um, much like President Furman and Alder Paulson just said, I do not support referring this. This is the exact time that we need to do this before the new Alders get in here, so we can implement this and train them on this before they take over mm -hmm. on council. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Coming in as a new alder two years ago, it was very important to have something written down that I can follow and look through and things like that. So with President Furman's work experiences as doing this job for the last year, we have now come to realize that things need to be written down so we are all on the same page and what better person than the person doing that job to bring that to the forefront for us. You know what I'm saying? Because I might not have personally known what the difference is, but he's doing this job, so I 
I, I, I trust in him that he um, is obviously going to set us up for success. And I believe that now is the time to pass this and let's start doing this the correct way and teaching the new people the correct way when they come in so it's already understood and we don't have to explain anything. So I ask the rest of my colleagues to please do not um, support referring this and let's take a vote on this tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Heck. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a brief comment. Uh, I agree that this uh, should not be referred, but I want to address the contention that uh, delaying this until the new council would be a good idea. Uh, I, I actually think that I know I was elected until April 18th, and I think we're obliged to do the business of the city as we can until April 18th, mm. when, whenever possible. Uh, so uh, I think we should go ahead and vote and deal with this. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Harrington McKinney for the second time on the motion. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I will, of course, be supporting this because I put it forward. Um, as I was going through looking at the research, um, I found that the uh, Common Council Policy Guide dated May 2019 has not been updated, and so much so that we have not even updated our current staff. The reason that I put this forward is, is that absolutely there are some really good salient points contained in this very good that was not the the question that I had the question is is that as we're pushing forward the with the ordinance and as the new alders coming in will be going through orientation it is very good to take some time and go through and make sure it's understood. I understand the council president has been uh, very involved over the past year, uh, but there is still tweaking to be done. Um, in uh, an instant for even myself is that I put a, a, um, a change in ordinance, uh, a, a legislative change in place, and um, without even being consulted, the president moved it to be placed on file. And so these are the nuances that we really do need to be looking at. I will absolutely support uh, placing this on file um, with a caveat is that there's solid, good information contained in that. I just don't see why we're pushing to put this in place um, effective um, tonight. Thank you, Alder. Alder Bennett. Yes. Um, well, let me be brief. I, I just have to re-up what uh, my fellow colleague said. Now is having a new, this being our last council meeting and having a new council is all the more reason why we need this. When, speaking from my experience, when we became alders, there was a lot of really important votes play, put on our plate that we really did not have the, um, I would say expertise to vote on and knowledge to vote on and knowing that we here have the knowledge about this specific issue is all the more reason why we should do it now rather than put it on a new council's plate to expect them to figure it out um, and instead we can move into the new council train them on how this is going to work rather than them finding out figuring out two systems at the same time thank you alder carter Calling for the question and a roll call. You're the last alder in the queue, alder, and there will be a roll call. I have no other alders in the queue wishing to speak. The motion is to place on file without prejudice. All those in favor, aye. Those opposed, no. As your name is called, and the clerk will please call the roll. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Alder Wahelia. Aye. Wahelia, aye. Alder Benford. No. Or Benford, no. Alder Bennett. The motion is to place on file. Alder Bennett, no. Alder Carter. Aye. Alder Carter, aye. Alder Conklin. No. Alder Conklin, no. Alder Curry. No. Alder Curry, no. Alder Evers. No. Alder Evers, no. Alder Figueroa Cole. No. Alder Figueroa Cole, no. Alder Foster. No. Alder Foster, no. Alder Furman. No. Alder Furman, no. Alder Harrington-McKinney? Aye. Alder Harrington-McKinney, aye. Alder Heck? 
Alder Heck, no. Alder Madison. No. Alder Madison, no. Alder Miadze. No. Alder Miadze, no. Alder Paulson. No. Alder Paulson, no. Alder Fair. No. Alder Fair, no. Alder Tischler. Alder Tischler, no. Alder Vetter. No. Alder Vetter, no. Alder Revere. No. Alder Revere, no. Alder Vitiver. No. Alder Vitiver, no. We have 17 no's, three ayes. With 17 no's, the motion fails. We're back to the original motion, which is to adopt the second substitute. Is there further discussion? Alder Paulson. I'll, I'll be very brief. Um, I think that this is a great change of, uh, a great package of changes that uh, will speed things along, will make things easier, uh, will get us out of some trouble that uh, we've gotten ourselves into uh, at least this past year and probably longer, not deep trouble, but things that have taken us uh, twisted us up a little bit and had to sort us out, uh, even on the floor. And then even uh, before, uh, there are some clarifications on the versioning is super important. It helps figure out what are we do, what should we do, what should we not do, how should these things evolve. I know I've struggled a little bit on, here's kind of what I want to do, but I'm not quite sure how to, to, to make it go forward. And having this clarity, I think, will make it a lot easier for um, legislation and resolutions uh, to be developed and make sure that everyone understands uh, how this goes. Um, my one wish is that we were even a little bit stronger on the versioning. Uh, there are some limitations of Legistar that I think maybe make it not quite as far as we could go because uh, I think even while things are in draft, I think we still could get ourselves into a little bit of trouble. But um, for what we've got Legistar and how we're collaborating, um, this is uh, this is very good, uh, and this is a tremendous improvement, and will make life a lot easier for uh, the next council. And as someone who is going to be watching uh, and uh, just uh, sharing my best wishes for them, I think this is uh, one of the best gifts that we can give them. So I hope that we are enthusiastically uh, uh, in support of this to to help them out. So thank you. I appreciate, I appreciate the laugh track. Uh, wasn't quite what I was going for, but I'll take it. Thank you, Alder. Alder Wahili. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I will not be supporting this, and I, the reason being is it's too rush, and I think we need to have our time to read thoroughly, understand thoroughly, and uh, be able to understand what the, it can have, uh, the repercussion of it. So I would be voting no, and that's a no uh, vote for me. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Harrington McKinney. Please register me as a no. Thank you, Alder. Uh, all right, so the motion before us is to adopt the second substitute. Let me try this uh, with the notation that Alder Harrington McKinney and Alder Wahilihe wish to be recorded as no votes. Is there objection to recording two no votes and the balance aye? Seeing no objection, that item passes with two no votes. And we'll move on to item 102, which is Legistar 76547, a substitute dissolving the ad hoc task force on the structure of city government final report implementation work group and transferring those responsibilities to the Common Council Executive Committee, President Furman. Move adoption of substitute. Okay. Moved and seconded to adopt the substitute. Are there questions on item 102? Alder Harrington McKinney. Um, yes, my question was the last um, portion of 102.76547, where it says transferring responsibilities to the Common Council Executive Committee. Um, and I'd like to offer a amendment. Uh, that, Alder, oh, we're, we're I mean, still in. I know, I know, okay. I know. I just caught myself. <laughs> Thank you, Alder. <laughs> just out of deference. It is, it is technically in order. You can make a motion at any time, but you have, there is one other Alder in the queue with questions. Thank you. Uh, Alder Wahili, did you have a question? No, okay. Uh, so, Alder Harrington McKinney, go ahead. I think we're playing with this. I'll just. You're on. Oh, on. Okay. Um, and so, uh, my amendment would be um, dissolving the ad hoc task force on the structure of government TFOGs 
final report implementation work group and transferring responsibilities to the Common Council, period. The motion, is there a second? Second. Okay, moved and seconded. And uh, Alder, will, I'll ask you to please uh, share that amendment in writing with your colleagues and the clerk. And let's just start good practice with the city attorney as well. It, it, it technically, it only applies to ordinances, but it doesn't hurt. Um, so then, uh, on the amendment, President Furman. Um, I asked my colleagues not to support this. Um, the Common Council isn't really a work group or a committee, and so I'm not really sure how uh, the Common Council would actually work on coming up with recommendations for the council to consider. Um, so it just it, it doesn't it doesn't make a lot of sense to me um, how how that would actually work in practice. The council doesn't do stuff like that. Um, to be clear. Um, what's what's being done is we're getting rid of uh, the implementation work group and saying that the Common Council Executive Committee um, should continue thinking about the recommendations and coming up with actionable proposals for the council to consider. And so if you just transfer that responsibility to the Common Council instead of CCEC, I, I don't know how anything happens. I mean, we don't have working sessions of the council. And I will say, unfortunately, based on experience, um, before I was president, even while I was president, trying to get like... Um, <laughs> sessions of the council uh, together, um, to, uh, uh, um, meetings of the whole um, with quorums, et cetera, is incredibly difficult, if not impossible. So um, I ask my colleagues not to support this. Thank you. Thank you, Alder, Alder Heck. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I also won't be supporting this, but I'd also point out that the words common council executive committee occur several times in the uh, resolution uh, so I would um, suggest that there needed to be a, a fuller consideration of what the resolution should read like if this were to be passed or even considered, maybe. Thank you, Alder. I have no other Alders in the queue for discussion on the amendment. So on the amendment, the motion is to amend the resolution to transfer the responsibilities to the Common Council as opposed to the Common Council Executive Committee. I'll anticipate the need for a roll call. So all those in favor of the amendment, aye. Those opposed, no. As your name is called, and the clerk will please call the roll. Thank you. Alder Helia. No. Well, Helia, no. Alder Benford. Aye. Alder Benford, aye. Alder Bennett. Alder Bennett, no. Alder Carter. No. Alder Carter, no. Alder Conklin. Alder Conklin, no. Alder Curry. No. Uh, Alder Curry, no. Alder Evers. No. Alder Evers, no. Alder Figueroa, call. No. Alder Figueroa, call. No. Alder Foster. Nope. Alder Foster, no. Alder Furman. No. Alder Furman, no. Alder Harrington McKinney. Yes. Alder Harrington McKinney, aye. Alder Heck. Alder Heck, no. Alder Madison. No. Alder Madison, no. Alder Miyadze. Alder Miyadze, no. Alder Paulson. No. Alder Paulson, no. Alder Fair. No. Alder Fair, no. Alder Tischler. No. Alder Tischler, no. Alder Vetter. No. Alder Vetter, no. Alder Verveer. No. Alder Verveer, no. Alder Vitiver. No. Alder Vitiver, no. We have two eyes, 18 no's. With two eyes and 18 no's, the amendment fails. We're back to the main motion, which is to adopt the substitute. And folks, let me just say, we have eight items left, so hold it together here. Uh, on the main motion, which is to adopt, is there further discussion? Alder Carter. Yes, I, I hate to say this, but I kind of agree with Alder Paulson, it needs, I think some of it after reading it needs to be, my internet is a little unstable, so I don't know if you can hear me or not, but I do think some of it needs to be cleaned up. If this went to attorney, uh, to our, um, our legal office, I think they need to take a second look at it. We don't want to pass anything that is not clear and concise. And let me also say this while we're on the subject. 
when you first come in, you don't have time to read anything. Let's be for real, folks. Thank you, Alder. I have no other alders in the queue wishing to discuss. The motion is to adopt the substitute. Is there objection to recording unanimous vote in favor? Alder Harrington McKinney? Register me as a no. Alder Harrington McKinney will be noted as voting no. With one no, that item passes. And we will go on to item 103. Item 103 is Legistar 76649, authorizing the city of Madison to develop a comprehensive response to the crisis in home health care in Madison. Uh, Alder Vetter, would you like to make the motion? Uh, move adoption of the second substitute, which is on your desk. It's not what is in the agenda there, but it was put on, placed on your desk tonight. And... Um, I just want to start. Let, let's get a second. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. It's moved and seconded to adopt the second substitute. Alder Vetter. Um, just wanted to begin by, they're very short and brief. Um, the statistics that I sent out to all of you that were attached to the resolution, and the first one is by the U.S. Census Bureau. It reads, about 4.5 million Americans with illnesses and disabilities are cared for at home by AIDS therapists or nurses, 4.5 million. That's from the US Census Bureau. The second is overall employment at home health and personal care AIDS is projected to grow 34% from 2019 to 2029, much faster than the average for all occupations. That's from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics 2021. The third is in 2016, a survey of over 500 people in Wisconsin of all types of disabilities showed that 95% experienced difficulty in finding in-home caregivers and 85% reported not having enough caregivers to fill open shifts. That's by the Survival Coalition of Wisconsin Disability Organizations 2016 as well as the World Health Organization 2020. The fourth is the median annual aid wage for home health care and personal care aides was $27,080 in May of 2020. It's from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics 2021. And the last one is the economic loss related to the exclusion of persons with disabilities from the labor force is 3 to 7 percent of gross domestic product, G GDP, from the International Labor Organization 2010. So with that being said, my speak on my resolution. Tonight's the night. Tonight is the night to begin work on how the home health care crisis can be addressed. It is a crisis. People need help now. You've already heard from all the people who registered tonight and supported this, showing that indeed the biggest challenge for people with disabilities living in Madison is this very issue. Without help, people like myself were being shuffled off to institutional care, assisted living facilities, nursing homes, and hospital. Without help, people are suffering from not having the right kind of care to stay healthy. Without help, individuals and their families are undergoing vast emotional and mental stress. Without help, people are becoming invisible and not able to speak out about this issue and much, much more. Without help, people are stuck in their homes unable to take part in the greater community. They become second-class citizens. There's an enormous need for city government as well as the higher level governmental bodies, the county, state, and federal bodies to do something about this. We're looking at the city's help tonight. In the resolution, I have several recommendations that the city could pursue, and there should be more. Finding direct connections to work with university and other higher educational level students and offering them stipends and benefits to their studies could be a very good connection between workers and uh, students and the people who need the help. Um, I'm going to find my place. <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, connecting directly with immigrant community, the immigrant community, since many in the immigrant community have a need to find employment. It's the perfect fit. 
also connecting with underemployed fo folks who need to find jobs, perhaps providing bus passes or something like it to help people get to their work who have very low incomes. This would help them. Perhaps providing some kind of child care relief for workers, for workers who have families and children and need to get to work and don't have the, the money to do so because of child care. Connecting directly with neighborhood associations to search citywide for workers in every single neighborhood. And specific city advertising, another uh, recommendation, specific city advertising like wraparound bus ads, ads through city channel, et cetera. The possibilities go on and on of what the city can do. There are m many more possibilities than this and ideas. Perhaps establish work, establishing work cooperatives in this field. One speaker spoke to this, and it's being done in other countries. It could very well work very well in this situation here, and perhaps much, much more than this. As you've heard, there are several entities, organizations, and groups who are already working on this issue. What we need to do, the city needs to do, is to help them and work together with them with the powers that the city has to find solutions and make the solutions happen by taking action. They need our help. We need their help. We need to work together. Things need to be worked on. Things need to be done now. The immediacy of this situation is now. And at last, I want to thank everyone who worked on this, who's been working on this. I want to thank specifically Karen Kapuza Kofal in the council office who helped me very much with the putting together the language of this. I hope I didn't slaughter your name, Karen. <laughs> and also to the co-sponsors who added their names to the resolution. Thank you very much to Alder Paulson and Alder Foster and Alder, I'm missing someone. Well, to Rebecca Hoyt and the Disability Rights Commission. Also, thanks to all my other co-sponsors who signed on. I very much appreciate your help and your assistance with this. I could not have done it alone. And thank you very, very much. So I just urge uh, support of this resolution to have it pass, adopted, hopefully unanimously, unanimously tonight by this body. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Paulson? Yeah, I'll be brief. Um, just a couple things to note. Um, one, this is sort of like um, the climate change crisis in that there are definitely a large space of action for uh, the national and state governments to act, but there's a significant place for local governments to act. And we're taking action locally on environmental issues uh, and around the climate change, and there are a wide space for us to take action uh, locally on this as well. I'd also just note that this is related to other crises that we're facing in Madison. One of the challenges in, uh, in finding uh, home health care workers is finding homes for the home health care workers, right? We have to, uh, they have to be able to live and get to, um, get to the houses that they're helping other folks at. Um, and so we have to remember that, um, you know, that the housing crisis that we're, we're battling directly impacts this and we have a lot of work to do uh, there. And just more broadly, uh, this is going to be one of the great challenges of the 21st century, besides environmental uh, issues and uh, equity issues. Um, helping people is going to be one of the great challenges and reorientating society around um, less about making things as we've got that more and more out of control. And as ChatGPT takes all the jobs, mm -hmm. the jobs that aren't going to go away are, are helping people. And so many people uh, in society need help. It's probably like 25% of people probably need some kind of help from someone else as part of their life. Maybe it's a caseworker, maybe it's an in-home caregiver, maybe it's child care, maybe it's um, uh, tutors, maybe it's something. There's so much work that we're going to have to, over the next generation or two, reorientate ourselves uh, to be able to help. And we need uh, to start working on that now because um, as a society, how we uh, make sure that all members uh, are, are treated is, is the true value of the society. So I think this is uh, one of the things I'm most excited about to sort of be leaving on uh, to, to kick off as a future direction um, is to, to help deal a little bit with that. But um, so I'm excited to see where this goes uh, and is part of what's going to be 
challenges certainly for the rest of my life and everyone's life uh, here as well from the great issues of society. So thank you. Thank you. Alder Harrington McKinney. Uh, Madam Mayor, this might be the first uh, time that this happens, but is it in order that, uh, and I don't know how to put it, but you will certainly straighten it out, is this that um, can we offer this as a unanimous um, support for this? I I'd like to be added as a sponsor. We'll add you as a sponsor, Alder, um, and we certainly will call for unanimous consent uh, at the end of discussion, but I think what you might be suggesting is that the entire council be added as sponsors. Absolutely. So Alder Harrington requests, Harrington McKinney requests that the entire council be added as sponsors. Is there any objection? Seeing no objection to being added, uh, we'll add the entire council as sponsors. Thank you, Alder. Uh, Alder Wahilahi. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I think I text you. I meant to be added one this item as a co-sponsor, not one thirty-eight. Yes, we've we've fixed that, Alder. Thank you, Alder Bennett. Uh, thank you. Well, um, I really I have to thank and commend and also admire you for your leadership, Alder Better or Mayor Satya. I have to, yeah. Um, on the alders work um and um i don't i don't want to go all into myself sorry but i can speak from my experience and i love telling this story um so many of you all know this um about my situation with my dad but um on october 15th i got the scariest call of my life saying that your dad is in um Fell out at work. I panicked, went there, went to his work, panicked and drove up to, his, to the hospital. And my dad had experienced cardiac arrest and was in a medically induced coma for five days. And those were the saddest days of my life, um, watching him with a ventilator tube down his throat. Um, and going through that, seeing the amount of work that the nurses did, working 12-hour shifts day in and day out to keep my dad safe, seeing the, the, the paramedics that saved his life, um, seeing all that they did for him. And on the fifth day, we didn't know if he would be alive, first of all. Like they said, he might have brain damage, he might not ever wake up, he might be a vegetable. But um, on the fifth day, um, they called me. They're like, OK, he's waking up. You need to come here right now. So I came. I held his hand. And for like hour an hour, just worked him through it because he was like panicking with waking up. And they needed to take the ventilator tube out. Um, and they took it out. And he coughed. Um, and the first thing he said was, I love you. Um, the second thing he said was, when do I get released? Yeah. <laughs> but it was like having, I already lost a parent, so having him there every day is like a miracle. Um, and since I go through all of that, since that time, you know, weeks went by, months went by, where now I've Change, transitioned roles from just being a daughter to a primary caregiver, to having to sacrifice time and energy every single day to care for my dad. And this is something I know is not solo to me. And I'd be remiss to say that this hasn't taken an economic impact on our family and on the many families in Madison. Um, this truly is an equity issue. It's an equity issue of who can afford a caregiver. Who can even have a caregiver? Who has the family to give a caregiving services? Um, and seeing firsthand how there's many people that go into these situations with no family, no one there for them, just the nurses and caregivers. So I'm 
I thank you again for putting this forward and just have to say that this is an extremely important issue to people living in Madison um, and affects everyone on a molecular, everyday level. Thank you, Alder. No other alders in the queue wishing to speak on item 103. The motion is to adopt the second substitute. Is there any objection to recording a unanimous vote in favor? Seeing no objection, we'll record a unanimous vote in favor of item 103 and move on to item 104, which is Legistar 76660, amending sections of the Madison General Ordinances to allow additional reconsideration opportunities. President Furman. Move adoption. Moved and seconded to adopt. Are there questions on item 104? Alder Wahilahi. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, if Attorney Haas could give us some clarification between um, when the I, when someone calls for um, reconsideration within the meeting versus outside the meeting, I'm a little bit just confused as how that can be. Um, what, what's the change? <clears throat> sure. The um, the proposed change. Oops, I'm sorry. Um, the proposed change would eliminate um, the requirement that an alder uh, have an excused absence, first of all. Um, and uh, would allow an alder who um, was absent at a meeting to move for reconsideration at the same meeting or at the next regular meeting. Right now, that is permitted for an alder who votes in the affirmative, or, or I'm sorry, who votes on the prevailing side. They can, they can make a motion for reconsideration at the same meeting or the next meeting. Um, but a, an alder who is absent <clears throat> for a portion of the meeting where an item was taken up uh, currently can only make a motion for reconsideration at the following meeting. So uh, this ordinance would put those situations on the same footing. So uh, if I can follow up with that, for example, there's an item on the floor and I went, I stepped out of the uh, meeting. And when I came back that most day, the, the, uh, there was a vote and I was not part of that. So to reconsider that, then I have to request for a consideration and it will need 11 vote or majority vote. A motion to reconsider requires two thirds vote, but you're correct that motion could be made immediately at the same meeting. Under current ordinance, it only it could only be made at the following meeting. I see. So, with the current one, if I stepped out and came back, I can request the same meeting. Currently, the ordinance only requires that motion at the following meeting. Following meeting. Okay. I think you know theoretically, maybe the council with unanimous consent might be able to allow the motion, but it does not specifically provide for it in the ordinance currently. Okay, but will that need two third vote or just majority vote? A motion to reconsider requires a two thirds vote, 14 okay. votes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alder. President Furman. Thank you, Mayor. Attorney House, um, I'd like actually some clarification. I, I believe how it was currently written before it was modified um, my understanding was if you were at, in the bathroom or you came to the meeting late or Zoom dropped off, you can't ask for reconsideration because that would not be considered an excused absence unless we start arguing about what an excused absence is. Well, uh, true. I kind of glossed over the excused absence, but I guess technically it, it, right now it says you, you can make that motion if you are absent due to an excused absence. So Correct, and so there is a definition for excused absence, right. and that's not going to the bathroom or losing a Zoom connection, et cetera, and this change fixes that. I, I, yeah, yeah, I think you're right, yeah. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for the correction. I have uh, Alder Wahilahi, further questions? So in reference to what our uh, President Perman said, if you drop 
uh, Zoom or you went to the bathroom, then you came back and it's already voted. Can we do without the uh, the super majority vote or I'm still not clear? Alder, a motion to reconsider always requires a super majority vote regardless okay. of the circumstances. So it still will be considered yes. a super majority. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, Alder. I have no other Alders in the queue. The motion is to adopt. Is there any further discussion, Alder Wahilahi? Um, is is it possible to remove that supermajority? Is it the Robert rule, or is it something that we can remove? I'm just asking Attorney Haas. Attorney Haas. Sure. Uh, under current ordinances, Robert's rules are, are Robert's rules are adopted unless the council deviates. So it is possible. For the council to pass an ordinance or including this ordinance and a motion to reconsider requires a majority vote it would it would be a significant difference i would say from what robert's rules requires also because of other ordinances in chapter 33 that would effectively be the rule for all boards commissions and committees unless um, other ordinances were changed okay. thank you well there no other alders in the queue wishing to speak. The motion is to adopt. Is there objection to recording unanimous vote in favor? Seeing no objection, we record a unanimous vote in favor of item 104. And we will go on to item 108. Which is Legistar 76200, a substitute resolution authorizing a sole source contract with Traffic Control Corporation for an integrated Centrax transit signal priority system. Uh, Alder Paulson, did you wish to make the motion? Yeah, I was wondering if uh, perhaps we could take up item 138 because it's a school night and I think that there may be a fair number of people who are out watching to see the outcome of this and the rest of them are uh, questions for council members. So perhaps we could table 108 and take up 138 and come back to do the rest of them. Is there any objection uh, from the council to taking up 138 at this time? Seeing President Furman, that's not an objection, is it? No, no objection. Seeing no objection, we'll take up 138 instead. Uh, 138 is... Uh, legislative file 76645, a substitute supporting bargaining between OPEIU Local 39 and CUNA Mutual Group on item 38. President Furman? Uh, move substitute. Move adoption of substitute. Moved and seconded to adopt the substitute. On item 138, are there questions? Is there discussion? Alder Paulson. I'd just like to be added as a sponsor. We'll add Alder Paulson as a sponsor. Is there further discussion? Alder Harrington McKinney. Please add me as a sponsor. Alder Harrington McKinney will be added as a sponsor. Alder Miadze. Um, I think city staff already got me. Yeah. I believe you have been added as a sponsor, Alder Miadze. Yes. Is there further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, is there any objection to recording a unanimous vote in favor of item 138? Seeing no objection, we'll record a unanimous vote in favor of item 138. And we will come back to item 108, which again is a resolution authorizing a sole source contract to purchase transit signal priority systems. President Furman. Move adoption of substitute. Moved and seconded to adopt the sub. Are there questions? Is there discussion? Alder Wahilahi. Yeah, I, item 108, 110, and 113, if Justin is there, uh, it's relating to bus uh, rapid transit. And for 108, the process of the contract I'm interested in, or if uh, Tom Lynch is here, um, just the process of the contract and updates on presentation for those three items. Director Lynch, do you want to start with item 108, please? Yeah, I'll start with that. Um, that one's a little bit different than the others. Um, so right now we have a, a certain 
traffic signal system that's by a certain brand. And so in order for us to implement transit signal priority, uh, it makes the most sense for us to use the same ground. It's it's like if you have a if you have a car that's a Chevy, you buy Chevy parts. And so this is a sole source contract um, that allows us to enter into a multi-year agreement uh, with that that vendor uh, to provide uh, traffic transit signal priority. Um, Yang is also on here, and this is. Mostly having to do with this uh, system. So, Yang, you, you may want to add something to that. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, I think you covered it well. Um, uh, yeah, it's a system that the city has uh, uh, already made a lot of investment uh, to manage our, uh, you know, almost 400 traffic signals. Uh, so, this, this will be add on components to that. Uh, so, if we look into, uh, you know, different options on the market. And uh, uh, these, you know, continue to use uh, the same similar vendor, uh, capitalizing on the existing system uh, would make most eco economical sense and also operational sense as well. Uh, so I think for this one, uh, you know, definitely uh, the sole source purchase from a similar vendor that we're using right now for the other part of the system uh, would be the best approach to go. So thank you. Thank you. I have no other alders in the queue on item 108. Alder Heck. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm I'm going to make a strange, ask a strange question or, or ask for a strange response. Maybe if the staff members who were on the Zoom call, I guess, I just want to make sure I understand that uh, in the days leading up to this meeting, that you were available for questions on this item. You can just raise your hand if you were, and. Uh, even in the weeks before this, as it was going through the BCC process, that you were available for questions on this item. Is that correct? You can just raise your hand, I guess, if you were available. <laughs> okay, Justin was, good. <laughs> okay, it's Yang, all right, about good. Which hand to raise? Uh, I, 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 my point was I just wanted to make sure that folks were available for questions on this item as, as we led up to this meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Alder Hack. Alder Wahilahi, did you have additional questions? Yes, uh, I, I think, you know, some alders confuse why items are being excluded. Not uh, just Alder, is there a question? No. Uh, yeah, I just want to make a comment. Okay, is there any other questions for staff? For 108, no. Seeing none, is there discussion on the item? Yes. Alder Wahilahi? Thank you. So, we are elected officials to represent the community and some of the items when we bring in to exclude is for discussion and for debate. And there are people, there's a lot of going on in the BRT that the communities are asking. And that's the reason why sometimes, you know, we have very uh, 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 priorities that are being uh, uh, taken into our consideration and it's it's always good to have the staff be prepared not only to answer our questions as a policymakers so that other community members are able to hear and can go back and see what was discussed instead of seeing in the news uh, paper the next morning that this item was passed without any discussion or without any community engagement so for that reason i would like to you know have this kind of discussion and have the staff explained the process of the, the contract that are being considered within the BRT. So, and, and to uh, uh, all the hacks question, it's not just undermining the questions of the staff, but also giving an opportunity for them to discuss and share the information, the process, who are we giving contract in terms of the equity lands, who have applied for this contract, is it just one particular organization that we're giving the contract? We as a city are focusing on the equity lands. And if we don't have the opportunity to disclose those uh, uh, process, then we are just cutting the people who are supposed to be on the table. So I just wanna make that note that it's not just because I'm making things difficult for my colleagues or my, my, 
uh, city staff is just because the community have asked the process. And I hope you consider that as a opportunity for learning, an opportunity for sharing, an opportunity for educating our community. So thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Bennett. Sure. I first of all want to say thank you to the staff that stay up through our meetings, past bedtime, school time, everything. And also, we'll note, I think it's important to be mindful of our fellow Alder's time and those that are coming here to speak on items, especially when there are just questions and no discussion. If every Alder had used council time to ask questions about each and every single agenda item, we would be here for days. That's why it's important to get these questions in before common council, rather than waiting to the floor and adding another hour, two hours to our meeting, adding time, staff has to be here late at night, um, just to answer simple questions that could have been answered prior to the meeting. So I and mean this as no slight, I understand wanting to have a discussion, but there really is no discussion here. This item is gonna pass and we're just, and yet we had Justin up here waiting to answer one simple question until 11 o'clock at night. Thank you, Alder. Alder Harrington McKinney. Um, I'm going to weigh in on this, and the reason that I'm going to weigh in on it is, is that, um, yes, it is 10 minutes to 11, but that's, a, that's, our, that's our job. Our job is to ask questions, make ourselves available, and also to ask questions of staff. It used to be a time that staff would be in the chambers and then we'd be able to ask those questions. Um, uh, I am absolutely um, in favor of going through the agenda. There is a lot of things that were in the agenda and we don't get a chance to double check and ask why. And we have to wait until we get to the council chambers. And the other thing is, is that sometimes when we talk about um, community engagement um, and educating ourselves being at this desk, we're also educating the uh, public as well because you know when we pass things and we don't give the opportunity for those who are watching either online or whatever, the, the ability to ask questions and to understand why we're doing what we're doing. We talk about public engagement and we talk about education, but we do it selectively. And so I just want to make sure that um, I get that on the record in terms of how and when we ask questions. And that should not be taken from um, our responsibility as elected officials. Thank you, Alder. We're getting fairly far afield from the item at this point. So I'll just remind us that the item before us is approval of a contract. Alder Carter. Call the question. It's called, Alder. I have no other Alders in the queue wishing to speak. So on the motion, uh, which is to adopt the substitute, is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor? Seeing no objection, we'll record an unanimous vote in favor of item 108. And we will go on to item 110 which is Legistar 76214, a substitute authorizing a competitive service contract with AECOM for project development and other engineering services associated with a north-south bus rapid transit line. President Furman. Move adoption of substitute. Second. Moved and seconded to adopt the substitute. Uh, are there questions? Alder Carter, your hand is up. Are there questions on item 110? Alder Wahilahe. Alder Wahilahe, you're muted. Uh, Justin or uh, Tom, just again, the process of supporting this Metro, uh, the uh, fiscal year two, 2023, if you can walk us through. Uh, yeah, I'll start and then maybe Justin can uh, add to it. Uh, we incorporated uh, planning for the North-South BRT in the 2023 budget. Uh, we solicited proposals. We met with quite a few 
engineering consultants to see if they'd be interested and or they met with us. Um, in the end, we received one proposal from the consultant that also designed our East-West BRT team. Uh, we did an evaluation of the proposal. They performed well with the East-West BRT uh, project, particularly under the time frame. Uh, it's made up of a while it's the contract is with one consultant, it's actually a team of 15 different consultants. Um, many of them are disadvantaged business enterprises, you know, some from the Madison area, some from the Milwaukee area. And so it's a, it's a well-rounded proposal. Uh, they've performed well on um, our project. We also received references from Milwaukee and Pittsburgh, and they performed well there. And so we're requesting that we can move forward and, and contract with them for design services for the North South BRT. And uh, and when you said there were fifteen consultants in one uh, uh, um, company, right? So out of those, can you talk about more about the diversity of those consultants, or if they are minority enterprise uh, to? be working with the city of Madison? Um, yeah, we had a 15% a DBE goal for this. And uh, I do know that some of them are uh, owned by people of color. Uh, I think there was maybe four, four or five DBE firms out of a team of 15. Justin, maybe you remember better, but so. Yeah, I, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but that sounds correct. Yeah. And then my final question is, in terms of the uh, evaluation uh, uh, criteria, do you have that in place or, or is it an outside firm that does the evaluation when you are selecting this particular consultant? No, we had an evaluation team that included uh, members of the transportation department, members from the engineering department and members from purchasing. And so we all filled out our, our rubric uh, and gave scores to the rubric and then uh, submitted it to the finance uh, department. And was the Department of Civil Rights part of that evaluation team? Um, Purchasing uh, department from DCR. Yeah, I, I don't know if they were part of the evaluation team or if, uh, if they they set the DBE goal and then they had to approve kind of the, um, you know, the, that portion of the, of the contract. Justin, do you kind of- Yeah, it, it, yeah you're right. It's the DCR does a review that's basically a pass fail um, for the, the DBE requirements. It's not necessarily scored for that. It's actually not allowed to be scored through federal regulations. Uh, the DBE program is a pass fail. It's not, a, it's not a sliding scale. So after the evaluation, then the DCR makes uh, the recommendation pass or fail. That, they actually make that recommendation before our scoring. Uh, they they approve it to move forward for scoring. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Carter, questions? Um, we're Justin, what is the timeline on this? Um, I think in a perfect world, you know, we have a lot of things going on, as you you know. You know, you, I only live in a perfect world, so <laughs> go, go forward. You know, if we could submit uh, a small starts application this year, that would be very good. Uh, it would, there's a, a lot of money available for bus rapid transit, and so the sooner we could get in the queue, that would be very good. Uh, we also just have to be cognizant of just workloads. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... In a, in a perfect world, maybe we could see uh, this being constructed in 2026, maybe. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Miyadze? Um, I guess this is probably not the time to say this, but um, given that we have an election coming up, but as an Alder that knows the district, I just want to encourage everybody that, you know, I know the culture of the district, so want to be working very closely with you guys as you guys, I know that's something that's probably in-house. I would love to work with you guys and when you guys come to that stage. Thank you, Alder. We have to have a contract first. <laughs> yes.
No other alders in the queue. So the motion is to adopt the substitute. Is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor? Seeing no objection, we'll record a unanimous vote in favor of item 110. Move on to item 113. Item 113 is Legistar 76342, a substitute supporting Metro's uh, grant application to the Federal Transit Administration's Areas of Persistent Poverty Program for planning work for the North-South BRT line. On item 113, President Furman, a motion? Uh, move adoption of substitute. Second. Moved and seconded to adopt the substitute. Alder Wahilahi. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, uh, Justin or Tom, if you could talk, just talk about more about the, the strategies for recommendation to improving uh, the transit service. You know, you have two strategies and hopefully you can be able to give us the uh, what's going on in there. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm not sure I follow in the context of this grant application or? Yes, yes, yes. So the, the grant application um, is really just requesting additional federal funding um, for the contract that uh, was just approved, um, the, the design contract. Um, this grant would, um, we'd be applying for another million dollars roughly um, in planning dollars um, to help fund that work. So that's really all this application is. Um, there's no guarantee that we would get that funding. Um, this is a resolution just um, recommend, or allowing us to move forward with that grant application to supplement that funding. Um, and, can, and can you talk about more about the 20 million, uh, the uh, persistent poverty program? Is that how it's embedded in the, in the grant? Can you talk about more about that? So the this the areas of pers persistent poverty is a federal transit administration grant program, um, and we were actually awarded about six hundred thousand dollars from that last year for this design work for the north south. Um, and this would just be a, a separate application um, to bring in additional funding. And the the program is intended to do early stage development work on projects that, that um, serve areas that um, meet the federal definition of um, you know, being a high poverty area. So um, that, that's really all it is. The grant program um, is, an, is limited to projects that serve those neighborhoods um, and um, is, is not intended for construction or anything else. It's, it's really just the earlier stage to planning and design work. And out of the twenty million, how much of that will will be going to those programs? Is it the whole pro, the whole amount or some of it? So our grant application is for one million. Mm -hmm. um, the the twenty million you're referencing may be the total pot that's available. I'm not, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, our application would be for one million, and that would go um, for the the overall corridor design work. So um, it would just contribute more to that pot that we would have to advance the, the planning and design work. Okay, and what will be the timeline in terms of the, uh, the grant application? Uh, the grant application would go in uh, in the next week, um, and then um, ultimately it's, it's up, to the, up to the FTA on their timeline. Um, sometimes they'll turn it around in a month or two, sometimes it takes them six to nine months. So. Um, I believe last year we heard sometime over the summer, um, and so I would expect something similar here. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you, Alder. I have no other Alders in the queue. The motion is to adopt the substitute. Is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor? Seeing no objection, we'll record a unanimous vote in favor of item 113. And move on to item 114, which is Legistar 76343, supporting Madison Metro's 5339B and 5339C low or no emission grant applications to the Federal Transit Administration for facility solar projects, chargers, and electric articulated buses. President Furman, a motion. Move adoption. Moved and seconded to adopt. Are there questions on item 114? Or is there discussion on item 114? Alder Tischler? Yes, yeah, since I'm the one who 
put this off. And so I, I, I realize it's late at night. Quick question. Um, and I do want to thank the uh, staff for, for going after grant funds here. Um, questions regarding solar. Will there be solar on bus, uh, sta- at bus stops? The other one is the, the other question there is um, commitment for local funding match. Is that just city funds or are there other local sources of funding? Sure. Um, so the solar installations would be at our two garage locations. They would not be at at bus stops. So they would be large, large arrays um, on the roofs of our large maintenance buildings. Um, so that's just uh, that's also where our charging is happening for our electric buses, and so that's where that would have the most impact um, in terms of adding that capacity. Um, and then the second question around the local the local sources. Um, so this this grant, in addition to the solar installation, would also fund bus replacements. Um, and it's our intent with this grant to um, to fund the replacements or the to provide the buses for um, a couple specific routes that serve UW and um, Epic. Um, and we are working with them on their financial contribution to this project. Um, since those are routes that serve those those entities and they are partners, they aren't city of Madison routes, um, they would they would pay the local share for that. So uh, the details are still being worked out. Um, I don't have exact dollar amounts yet, but yes, the intent is for some um, cost sharing um, on the local side uh, with these partners and it's not entirely coming from the city of Madison. Thank you. Do all there? No, there are others in the queue on item 114. The motion is to adopt. Is there any objection to recording a unanimous vote in favor? Seeing no objection, we record a unanimous vote in favor, and item 114 is adopted. That will take us to item 135. Which is Legistar 76398, authorizing the negotiation and execution of a contract with HNTB for continued passenger rail study services. President Furman. Move adoption. Moved and seconded to adopt item 135. On item 135, are there questions? Alder Tischler. Uh, thank you, Mayor. That's, that's, yeah, that's me again for uh, keeping us all here late tonight. Um, Yes, question for for uh, Tom. I guess this this RFP came out a year ago, uh, and I'm just wondering why there was uh, no competition, um, and I guess the status of the uh, study, and when um, maybe I mean perhaps some people on the on the council have seen it, but when when it'll be available to review a draft version? Yeah. So. Um, uh, there's multiple questions in there. So uh, in the 2022 budget, there was $120,000 that allowed us to pursue an RFP for passenger rail planning services, uh, which is not a large contract. So we did an RFP uh, for passenger rail planning services. And within that R- RFP, we said that we would have the uh, ability to negotiate with the winning firm if other funds uh, became available. And so uh, other funds became available in 2023. And so we're uh, moving forward to to negotiate additional services with HNTB uh, to help with that. Um, The 120,000 was really quite limited. Since that said, look at a couple more station locations and do some modifications. And so this will allow us the opportunity to do that. Uh, When we had our now, as far as uh, the status of the project, um, we had our initial uh, public meeting, uh, I believe it was in November or December, highly attended. Um, this spring, though, we've, uh, we had hoped to perhaps have a, a, an additional public meeting, but instead we've done a little bit more background information and wait, uh, waited for the Wisconsin DOT to submit a an application to the Federal Rail Administration's quarter identification program. I believe they'll be submitting that next Monday. So after that, we'll 
uh, kind of restart some of the some of the more public facing study elements, and hopefully we'll have you know a, a public meeting showing some of the evaluation in May or June. Eva, yeah. Thank you. Alder Carter, questions? Yeah, I just wanted a clarification. Is this by chance the same folks that were here for the initial meeting that you had, Tom? Well, it is a, it is the uh, same consultant. Yeah. Did they were they helped represent the project at the meeting in November, December? So okay. Yes. Yep, that's what I wanted to know. Thanks. Thank you, Alder. I have no other Alders in the queue. The motion is to adopt. Is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor? Being no objection, we record a unanimous vote in favor of item 135. And that brings us to the end of our agenda. Alder Wahilahi, it's your turn. Uh, move to adjourn. Moved and seconded to adjourn. Is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor of adjournment? Seeing no objection, we are adjourned.